Here. Supervisor Munger? Here. Supervisor Whistler? Here. Supervisor Palmer? Here. Thank you. And if we could all stand for the pledge and remain standing for the invocation. If I could ask the Chief Shallowitz to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you. We have uh, Supervisor Conant lead us in the invocation. Let me assume a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the people we have before us today to make comments to the public about how the county needs to be run. Please let the Board of Supervisors have the input from the public and the community to give us the wisdom we need to make the right decisions for Southern County. In Jesus' name we pray and we find someone Lord's prayer Amen. Amen. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay, the first thing on the agenda we have is uh, public comments. We're going to open it up right away to from the public to start with. Yes, Bill. Just a, just a couple. Uh, you can say your name so they can just Bill Beaver, you yes. city, yeah. born and raised, you can We know who you are, I just want to make yeah. sure you uh, Yeah, I looked an hour and a half ago on the Board of Supervisors of calendar. I didn't see this post anywhere. In the paper, it says 1060. There. Kind young lady told me where it was at, at a hall. So, you know, we need to get these things out in public and open and we get a little bit of lead time. And other than my gripe, I'd like to commend the uh, Board of Supervisors for sending a letter to uh, Xavier, Sarah, in regards to uh, this no report report on the grand jury. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you for your comments, appreciate it. Anyone else with comments? Okay, there being no further public comments, we'll start with introductory um, introductory comments. And that's uh, Mr. Mitnick. And Mr. Smith will have a clicker. Thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. So we're at the, the time of year where we do the uh, annual goals and priorities and uh, other policy documents. Uh, normally we would do this in the spring, in April or May, right before we get into the budget to process the various cal calendar challenges and such came about. So it got postponed and here we are today. The budget has been approved, the recommended, recommended budget was approved and we're in the end of this year. Yeah, but before I do that, I would like to thank our host, uh, Jessica Hosenberg. Right there, thank Jessica and, and the museum for the use of this wonderful facility. Um, you know, a lot to be proud of here. And as everybody came in and parked over here or walked this way, we saw the new community garden that the uh, board approved that's uh, been uh, in the works now. I do want to use that as an example as to how your staff uh, approaches its work and tries to be sensitive uh, to you know, impacts on residents and so on. So initially, the community garden was proposed to be on the uh, west side of the building, some of the neighbors became concerned, but rather than give up and quit, uh, Jessica and her team did some problem solving and ended up moving it over to the east side of the building, and I think that's working well with the neighbors. Right? <coughs> so it's a really nice uh, community benefit, community asset. So we have a lot to celebrate here uh, in the county. Might as well focus on something here at this facility. So we want to thank uh, our hosts. Okay, so by way of agenda, how are we going to work? Um, it could be new for a while, or we might go fairly quickly. It is really up to the board, but we have a format, and I'll walk you through that format. We're going to start out with the introductory comments on being disappointed, and then we will have some updates for the board. We have more subject areas. One will involve an update on what's going on with the organization. I'll, I will do that. That will be relatively short. And then our fire chief and our emergency services manager, Brenna Howell, she will provide, the, the two of them will provide an update on the center piece fire that happened uh, last week. Happened within uh, 24 hours. Uh, everybody involved did an outstanding job and then uh, there was no loss of uh, property or, or life or anything like that. So they'll give an update on that. Scott Thurman 
will give us an update on the homeless situation. That is coming in front of the board in September, September 11th. But we thought it would be good to be a good opportunity today to bring you up to speed on where we are with that issue. And then after that, Neil Hay, our development services director, will provide an update on our public facilities. We do have a public facilities master plan uh, concept coming in front of the board later. Again, these are a sample of the topical issues that the county is wrestling with, so we thought we'd focus on those. From that, we'll go to item three, which is a proposed countywide mission statement. The county does not have a mission statement. So based on input we've received from the board and others, we've come up with a, a simple one to start with. We'll see what you want to do with that. The next is a customer service philosophy. It's another uh, uh, statement type thing. And this is for the frontline employees, uh, some guidelines for, for those folks. And then from there, we'll go to the countywide goals. There's, the, there's 10 broad goals. And they have served the organization well. Those were approved by the board last year. And we'll talk a little bit about those. But the meat of what you will spend time on will be your top priorities. Currently, there are 10 and the board. It's your prerogative to change that number if you would like for the fiscal year that we're in. After that, we'll spend some time talking about the board norms. And Mr. Lopez uh, will, will lead that discussion. And It'll be up to your, your board chair to get to a point you think we should take a break. Okay. Happy to do so. We do have lunch at 12, as the indicator. So whenever Mr. Chair, you feel like we should take a pause, we can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So why don't we move into the next one? Let's see if I can figure it out. Is it the arrow? So I, I just got I don't know, but okay. we have Ken didn't help. Uh, a number of budget issues 
And I, I don't want to sugarcoat those or downplay those, but we do know that those are out there and your employees are ready to deal with that and we will come up with some recommendations as we move forward. But having said that, from a leadership perspective, this board is a very good governing board in that you're stable, you're focused, and you are forward thinking, you get along very well together as your staff. There's not much of not much uncertainty with respect to what's important to you. The fact that you're doing goal setting like this, that's a, that's a real positive sign. So there is leadership, there is vision, and there's some continuity of, of governance, and that, that's a good thing. I just want to point that out. Yes, there's, there are a lot of challenges out there. The organization's had to deal with quite a bit of drama over the last couple of years. We still have drama in front of us, but I'm proud of to share that we are working our way through it. We're not running from the challenges, we're acknowledging them, and we're, we're dealing with them head on. And again, that is part of the purpose of doing what we're doing uh, today. And one of the things I share with the, the executive team and the staff in our office is it's important to look toward the future with optimism and embrace it. And we have huge challenges, but let's acknowledge it's there. We have smart people here, we'll figure it out. And the organization has over a 1,000 employees. That's a lot of employees. We have departments that are as small as uh, the museum, one and a half or two employees, all the way up to Health and Human Services with well over 400. So we have uh, a vast array of size. There's any way to feel that on the way Yeah, if you would speak up a little bit. Yeah, sorry. We didn't plan that one well, did we? Um, <laughs> one of the, uh, again, we are we're trying hard to move from blame fixing and focus on problem solving. So when the board is uh, dealing with a difficult issue, we're doing our level best to come up with solutions rather than to focus on the past and blame, uh, blame others. But it's taken this organization a while uh, to make the shift, and we're still doing it. There's been a lot of successes, and I just wanted to uh, provide a few examples and not necessarily big ticket items, but I asked the department heads to provide some samples of things that they're proud of. Let me just share with you a, a, a few things. The community garden, that's a good example. The night at the museum, kids program, that's going very well. I think you've been doing that since January. Mm -hmm. It's a big hit with parents, right? Yeah. It's a small thing, but it's Jessica's way of saying, hey, what can we do here that's positive for the community? Doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Um, and that's, that's a good example of some success successes we have. In Health and Human Services, they moved to make all the county facilities, whether we own them or lease them, smoke free. Uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, they expanded the nurse home visiting program. Now we're in newborns up to three year old plus, right? So a small thing, but really good for quality of life for our residents. We're very proud of the right out co-location program we have with behavioral health providing the health care uh, or excuse me the mental health professionals who deal with crisis as they come into the emergency room we've received national and statewide recognition for that program nancy i think when your staff uh, came up with this they were looking at uh, problem solving at a local level and i don't think we realized we were doing something that was quite innovative and unusual throughout the country and we have Healthcare professionals from all over the country, maybe even other countries, knocking on the door asking, How did you do it? And when you look at it, it seems very simple, right? right. It seems very simple, but you're, you're colliding two organizations with their own um, cultures and policies and procedures and requirements. So yeah. that actually was the more difficult. Okay. And I'm just trying to delineate for um, the board. These are some innovative things that your staff are doing right now, despite all the challenges that we face. The Gray, 850 Gray Avenue lease, and a lot of credit that goes to those who work on that. We have that lease. We're looking at the possibility of acquiring it, if that's possible, but that's going to provide the community with a one stop shop for pretty much most of your health and human services uh, over the long haul. So that was a big achievement. Related to that 680 Walton Avenue, the lease that was uh, arranged there and the tenant improvements that are done. And we have our uh, public assistance call center there and some other uh, back office uses there. About 65, 70 employees are there. They're working in conditions they only dreamed about. And um, due to the board's leadership, we were able to deliver to those employees very good use of uh, taxpayer funds. Um, an interim use for a few years until, until 850 grades done. 
the library literacy program and the multicultural women's dance program at the River Valley High School is so successful it's going to have to move over to the paragraphs. That's a small, another small example of uh, sort of thinking outside the box to achieve certain sort of objectives. And the library's, uh, the library's done a lot of great things. I'm the uh, James director. Recently, the library hosted the nationally recognized poet, uh, Marcelo Hernandez. Marcelo. Right. Uh, that's an example of the type of quality program that James is bringing to the community. Also, he did succeed, James succeeded with the Live Oak Library, getting uh, those kind of improvements done and having that up and running. And there's a whole list of others. I'll stop there. I just wanted you to know good things are happening in your organization. These are small examples. Challenges. You've heard me say over and over we have financial challenges, we have budget challenges, we have a we do not have a structurally balanced general fund budget. We have to fix that. We're working on it. We will move forward, as we'll hear a little bit, uh, with a financial strategic plan to, to identify what our challenges are. But living off of fund balance and salary savings and treating that as a revenue is not a good practice. And that number is only increasing. So um, we're not going to say the sky's falling, the world's ending, but we will tell you it's not a sustainable practice. And Part of the, the challenge is acknowledging that that's a challenge, and then we'll work on long-term uh, solutions for that. We do have an extremely low and limited revenue base. As you've heard me say, taxes here, even though everybody thinks taxes are high, or are high, but here in Southern County, this is as low as it gets in California. That creates challenges for the services we're trying to provide. And we have to just acknowledge that that's our reality. We have some pension obligations, which is common throughout California. We've identified that for the board. Our auditor, controller, and assistant county administrator have done exemplary work uh, in acknowledging that. And, uh, the pre-funding each year came from the auditor, controller, and our treasurer. That was a great uh, suggestion, and that is saving the organization and taxpayers a significant amount of money, and we'll keep doing that. Our OPEP obligations um, as well um, are out there. We acknowledge that. We're not running from uh, those obligations, but we have to come up with a plan as the costs go up a million dollars plus each year. We have to figure out how to fund that. We are also moving to have a, a CAFR, a Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. If we don't have that. We're getting close to having that. And we're, uh, we're working hard to get our budget and our financial reports to a, a caliber and quality that will be eligible for GFOA and CSMFO recognition and awards. We need that, so when we go to do bond issues, like for example, for uh, 850 grade, we'll, we'll get a better bond rate, which means a lower uh, debt service payment. So organizationally, a lot of good success in terms of working together as a team. We, we have a ways to go, but your executive team, your department heads are working uh, together. We're, we're, we're improving with, with each month. We've had some challenges, but we are working our way through that. And I have shared with board members on our regular meetings uh, the, the successes that we've had, so I won't necessarily repeat them uh, here. But we know that we're moving from an organization that was very insular and had a lot of silos and we're trying to be more team-oriented. And when we move away from having 30 facilities and we can go into campus settings, that will force people to be uh, together and work uh, closer and will interact uh, better. But we are working on it. So a lot of uh, good opportunities. We'll hear more about that. I don't, I don't want to have to repeat it. Uh, we are taking a good look at our staffing levels. I shared this with you before. When vacancies come up, we take a good look at the positions. Do we really need them? Can they be restructured? Are there different ways of doing things? Um, I, I'm really um, excited and happy to share with you that as there are openings with different agencies around us, we're talking to each other. Uh, Mr. Bindorf, the CAO in Yuba County, when there are openings over there, he calls me and we talk about can we share? Can we share services? Uh, there are a few right now, I don't want to put it out here now because I don't want people to misinterpret it, but where there's some common vacancies right now where we're looking at can we join those two together and have one department head rather than two? Um, I recently received a call from the old county CAO. Um, they have an opening and he's wondering if we can share and maybe share with uh, three or four counties. So we're trying to be more innovative and cost effective. And in some cases, it doesn't make sense to, to do it. But we made reference to the uh, co-location program over at Rideout. That's our behavioral health department, or our 
operation, and that is Yuma County and Sutter County together. And the juvenile hall is three counties. So we'll continue to, to look at uh, doing more and more of that. If we were private companies, we'd be doing that. Yuma City and, and um, Live Oak and Sutter County, we'd probably merge if we were, if we were comp private companies. And, uh, because it'd be way more cost effective, it wouldn't be the duplication of effort, save a lot of money to deliver services and a more efficient model. But it's very hard for the government to do that. But your county does do that currently with other counties. And we're gonna keep exploring that. We have a lot of cooperation. A large percentage of our workforce, as you know, is retiring, making, uh, not retiring, but moving on to another opportunity. But her department over the last year has hit very hard with retirements. Is it safe to say you had one third? Yes. So one third of her department, she lost. And it's very hard to recruit here in the U.S. Southern area for, for most of it. It's not all, but for many. So when we lose individuals, it's very challenging to find them. So we have a, an older workforce, a large percentage of our employees are over 45, 50. Um, I have some data here, but I won't go over that. But a lot of people are gearing up for retirement. And so we know that the next three to five years, more and more. So trying, dealing with succession planning is a big challenge for us. So our office, the CAO's office, has been um, rebuilt, restaffed. We're at fully staffed. Proud to say that, and we, I'm proud of the individuals in the office. Uh, human Resources is going through um, a change now with the HR director. Um, we left in, in May. We're getting close to filling that position probably within the next week or so. So we hope to get a real good leader there to, who can build on the work that uh, Regina did before. So that department's going in a good direction. Um, child Support Services, General Services. Uh, we have uh, interims in. Those roles or don't just will have an interim, so we'll have to work on filling those. We're taking a look at the overall organizational structure. I know we've talked about that before. We'll spend more time doing that over the next year and we'll look at uh, possible um, changes, but none are on the horizon right now. And I would like to end on the organizational stuff by simply saying it's easy to be in this type of job and say everything's horrible, but I'm going to tell you the glass is half full and we have a much brighter and better future down the road if we want it. And if the board stays focused and we faithfully implement your direction and we stay together as an executive team and employees, we can help you get there. Uh, I really uh, believe that. I've worked with Juan Lopez for over 15 years and, and he's uh, helped me in different organizations uh, deliver on those type of commitments. And, uh, we can do it here. I'm very proud of the employees of this uh, organization. We have good unions good department heads, we can get there. I really believe that. So, having said all that, don't have a clipper that works. But, but Justin's here. We'll go to the, um, I'm gonna go to the next presentation, and while we do that, you can figure out the technical challenges. So, item number two under subject updates is the Southern Buttes Fire Debriefing and Emergency Management Update. So I'm going to turn that over to John Chalowitz, a fire chief. making some adjustments we can go ahead and kick this off. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Brenna Howell. I'm the emergency operations manager for Sutter County and uh, John Shallow, Sutter County Fire Chief. Uh, <laughs> um, we're going to give you a presentation today on the, the uh, and summarize what happened uh, in the Buttes fire. We're going to kick it off with some incident management details 
and then we'll go into some brief lessons learned from that incident. So, okay, go for it. Okay. So uh, we're going to go over, like as Brenna said, we're going to go over, and I like to walk and talk, so I probably won't be here. I'm a little bit mobile showing you the maps. Um, hopefully that doesn't hurt anything with your film. Up. So I'll, I'll talk loud. I'm good at that sometimes. Uh, so basically, uh, we're going to give this overview. This is a picture that was professionally taken the night, uh, the first night of the fire. We kind of get, yeah, don't do that. No. <laughs> um, so basically, this is a professional picture taken of the, uh, the, the dude's fire. Um, and I'd like to go into one thing first, and a lot of questions that have come out since the incident about how the fire department names fires. And there was some confusion from the social media and some of our employees, how we name fires. And the fire department usually names them geographically by where the fire is, or off like a road that it starts off of. Um, there was questions about the car fire. The car fire started off Car Powerhouse Road off Highway 299. Why it's called a car fire. It wasn't an actual car fire. It was something else. But so that's how that those things step start. With the Buttes incident, um, there was a lot of confusion in the beginning. People thinking this fire was in Butte. We call it Buttes. I didn't call it Sutter Buttes. We call it the Buttes incident to make it very simple. And that's the reason that we did that. So without killing a dead horse, that's why we do that those things. That way. So on an incident overview, this is actually pretty early on the incident. This picture here is probably within the first hour of the fire starting. Um, the fire started Tuesday, July 31st at about uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, the fire started on the east side of 11201 Pass Road. Okay, if anybody doesn't know where that is, that's just over the pass on Pass Road, or just over the, the peak on Pass Road and in between that road and Brockman Canyon Road. And I'll kind of show you on the map where that is. Uh, so basically, that fire started, uh, your, your fire services were actually on another fire at that time. Uh, we were all in the South County, part of South County, uh, just south of Oswald, um, all of our Oswald station on Oswald Road, actually, on a Starship fire. Uh, and all of our resources were committed down there when this fire was reported. Uh, so we had challenges right off the bat. Um, obviously, everybody knows California is in the uh, wildfire season of history. Uh, we've seen some of the largest fires in the history in the past year. Uh, two of the largest fires in the state of California have happened within the past 12 months. So we're, we're now seeing we're going to get hit with these things too um, in the views. So basically, um, so the fire started, but first in units we had uh, help from Meridian Fire Department. They were in quickly, got in there, and the fire was, they said initially the size of a bus when they first got there. Uh, I was about, uh, I don't know, eight minutes behind that first in unit, and as it says right there, it was already about 60 to 100 acres within eight minutes. Um, the fire was being wind driven, it went up the hill pretty quick, and, and immediately, if people can't see here, right there, those are our big communication towers that are in the buttes. Um, very large infrastructure, not just for the county, uh, for state level, uh, federal level, uh, emergency, uh, emergency responders have a lot of their stuff over here. Cal Fire, uh, DEA, CIA, FBI, there's a lot of stuff up there. Uh, huge site, very important for us to make sure we didn't burn that down. So immediately that was my, my priority to make sure that we did not lose that uh, and try to redirect that fire. Uh, as the fire grew, obviously, uh, I'll explain something about Sutter County. We're different than almost, well, we're different than any other county in the state except for one other county, which is San Francisco County, when it comes to fire operations. Um, Cal Fire, uh, because of the state fire agency, has responsibilities in every county except for Sutter County and San Francisco County. Meaning they don't have, I don't have that resource in my pocket to unlimited, just make unlimited words uh, of resources. So we had a challenge from the get-go. Um, getting resources here, the financial way of how we pay for those things, um, but as we get to the end of this, uh, this incident would have been well over $2 million to run this incident. This was, and this was only a day and a half incident. So we had a lot of resources, we had a lot of help, I'll get into that in just a minute. But, Basically, so that you understand, we have to request resources very specifically how we do it, uh, and they don't have to give them to us. 
because we don't have Cal Fire here. They don't have any responsibility here. The only small piece of property within the county that is actually a state-owned property is in the very dead center of the Buttes. It's called Peace Valley Park, and that's run by the state parks. Uh, and we actually, at Southern County Fire, have a fire contract with that. Cal Fire has no responsibility in that. So we're already up against a lot of challenges right off the bat. Um, obviously, with staffing issues within the bar my department, myself, um, looking at trying to fill positions, and also we run very thin with the level of knowledge staffing that we have within our department, um, which is something we're trying to work for to find out how we can fix that issue. With all the agencies that were in the county, um, as I put direction out to the board and updates, with all these fires going on, I had two strike teams out, which is five engines and a strike team leader on different fires. We were all fully staffed. We, didn't, we were not at a situation where those strike teams being out influenced how many people we could get into the use and why we fought this fire and why it took so why it got so big. It had nothing to do with that. Um, so I want to get that out there too. So basically, as this fire moved through, uh, it began to get bigger. I did request, request resources from Cal Fire. Um, and as people saw, probably through the internet, uh, we had uh, air, aircraft, we had helicopters, four air tankers. Uh, we had what's called an air attack, which is basically a boss in the air. Uh, and I got a lot of ground resources from uh, Cal Fire to help with the overhead level, which is my level, more of the command level stuff. Uh, worked great with the, as you can see right here, tag teaming with the uh, Sheriff's Department. Uh, a great response from our dispatchers. They were very overwhelmed, as you, as you would only imagine. Um, the Sutter Buttes, obviously, is the center of Sutter County. Everybody looks to the Sutter Buttes. And when you see a large smoke column coming out of the Sutter Buttes, obviously, everybody in their uncle is concerned about that because it's our pride and joy. So there's a lot of calls coming into the public uh, communication center. Um, they were able to get me a command van, which is uh, jointly staffed uh, by our staff and the Sheriff's Department, uh, which was a great resource. Um, and I'll get into a lot of the thank yous here in just a little bit. But as the fire uh, increased, uh, we moved into a situation where the fire went up, started going up towards the, uh, the towers. We attacked the fire from the air very heavily. It was a very remote fire for us to be able to make access to. Not good access on this fire. Uh, this fire grew greatly because we couldn't even make access to it. We had to watch it burn a lot of ground. The good thing about where this fire burned, not many homes, not many uh, infrastructure except for the uh, towers, the, the towers, sorry, the towers up here, and multiple gas stations, or gas stations, gas wells, sorry, um, that are in the news. But we really, we had a grass fire, and we really didn't have anything out in front of it. Wind shifted, about right in the middle of this fire, the wind shifted, and there's four residences to the right here, if you guys look over on the map, four residences to the west on Pass Road, which immediately, this fire started burning this way towards the west. So it went off this picture this way, um, which changed from what's going on in this picture. As you can tell, the wind's blowing it that way. If we had this picture bigger, you'd see a big fire over here. Um, it pushed off that way towards Rockland Canyon. We were concerned, and at that point, uh, with the help of the Sheriff's Department and UC PD, we were able to get uh, officers in there immediately to evacuate the four residences off Pass Road, and then also do advisory evac evacuations of Kellogg Road in case we had a wind shift to the east, and also off Westview on the far west side. We were able to get them advisory. Um, and as we just talked about during the floods, and you want me to go over the advisory versus? Okay, okay so everybody understand what's the difference between a mandatory and advisory. Uh, we, that's been a great topic for the past few years of how, what, what evacuations and how you say it. Mandatory evacuations is get out, and it's your responsibility to get out. We have imminent danger to you, and that's why we would say that. A uh, evacuation advisory was more put in the role to, we have a problem, it could affect you, we want you to be ready to go in a moment's notice. If you want to leave, we'd be highly suggested. That's where an advisory comes in. So for everybody to understand. And I think it's important to mention too with the mandatory evacuations is once we call for those mandatory evacuations, we cannot physically force people from their homes, but we do have the authority to not let them back in. So sometimes people think that when we call for mandatory, we physically, we do go house to house, we call, we post it on social media, but we can't make them leave their homes if they choose to do so. But we saw that over the weekend in the fire, the Holy Fire in um, Orange County and Riverside County, 
lots of residents decided to stay with very active volatile fire and put themselves in danger. So that's, that also leads to the confusion sometimes. Okay. And they also led us to some of the things that we see happen some of the fires this year where people not taking advice and being heard. So uh, as the fire progressed, we had resources uh, from numerous departments. Uh, I tapped into what's called the Master Mutual Aid Agreement. It used to be called what's called the Seven Points of Light Agreement. If anybody has ever heard of that, basically the way that it works in emergency services, since I do not have Cal Fire within our county, I got to have some way to get resources here to help the citizens when we're over for uh, over tax. So I requested these resources. Like I said, through that agreement, uh, they were able to provide me a lot of resources. Uh, we were able to get resources out of Sacramento County, which was for free. Uh, great, great response uh, out of other departments. So basically, this fire, as you can tell over here, oops, went big, right? From where I said it started, we started to go up. Initially, uh, the fire grew at about a rate of about three to 400 acres per hour. It was moving at a pretty good clip. It uh, started to die down that night. Uh, we initially had put it at 2,200 acres, and this is another line of concern that uh, people were very uh, vocal about. As I initially put it out, there was 2,200 acres, and then the next morning it went down to 800 acres. That's very common in fires, very common. Because what happens is that fire was covered in smoke, and they're trying to judge that from an aircraft. And so they, they tried to plot with the fire, and they thought was. us. Until the morning, we got a really good picture of it. Um, we then figured out the actual perimeters of the fire, and we were able to figure out the total size. Um, initially, like it says here, 2,200 acres. At the end of the fire, we ended up with about 1,240 acres. If you say, call it 1,200 acres. Uh, 1,237 is the exact uh, number of acres. And we contained it at 2,100 hours on the first. Um, during that time, uh, well, and the last part of that fire, fire is currently under investigation of how it started. It was suspicious in nature, and we will be working to make sure we try to get a cause. Um, so with the fire, without getting too much into the exact what took place in the fire, um, I'd like to get into, this is the key part, the fire agency. What we saw from surrounding agencies, our public, and our other divisions of this county was amazing. Uh, I, I couldn't ask for better support. Sutter County, New York City, Marysville, Linda, Oliver's, Meridian, Maxwell, Sac River, East Nicholas, Pleasant Grove, Beale Air Force Base, Sacramento Metropolitan, Sacramento City, consumed this fire, which is Elk Grove. Cal Fire and Cal OES all had resources within the county, and we didn't pick one cent for them. They were here to help brother out. So that, that's, that's very respectful, extremely high level of support. Supporting agencies for us, obviously, by coming into us, great job. Uh, when we did displace the four people, Brian, I'll kind of go over that, we did have, uh, did initially open a uh, evacuation center at Sutter High School. They were very nice to get everything open, and Red Cross started that with us and Brian can with it. That stuff. County departments, um, sheriff's office. I cannot thank them the most. The I mean, they were extremely supportive from the side of just trying to keep people out of abuse um, and keep them let us do our operation with their traffic control to the evacuations uh, and to the logistical support with uh, communications and obviously the uh, uh, command band that currently we have within the county. Um, general services, my communication uh, within these incidents is I have something to do in the field and I communicate with Brenna and the CEO's office and the PIOs uh, on the side. And Brenna can kind of go into that. So with the county departments, because um, they're typically called into the emergency operations center, but with a fire like this, because it's not Cal Fire's jurisdiction, we also, the EOC, needs to support the incident itself. So the county departments not only supported us at the EOC level, they supported all of the operations that were going on um, at the command post, such as like quarter potties, um, the command van, um, staffing, road closures, road departments, sheltering, human services staff, things like that. So we're used to, I'm used to when Cal Fire comes into an incident, they bring all of that stuff to support the incident, and then I can deal with the county level stuff, the human services, the public health, the media, um, social media, all of those things that we need to do, briefing our elected officials and things like that. So the county departments provided a ton of support to us that night. We're really appreciative of that. And then also the private support. The private support was really great because 
they started feeding people on their own. Um, the citizens came out and really wanted to support the fire command post, and they did that. They fed them dinner, they fed them breakfast, they brought coffee, uh, they were going to run equipment if we needed them, although we couldn't do that. But they were there to support, um, willing, willingly support us there. It's the first time I saw 300 Little Caesars pizzas. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's no lot. There was 300 pizzas there. And it was overwhelming. Um, and then lunch the next day. And of course, Bi County doesn't have to stage there. Bi County Ambulance stayed there with a full crew to make sure that everybody was rehabbed. We had Gatorade, had water, had ice, packed the lunches for the incoming crews. And so when we, we have crews coming in on mutual aid, we need to be able to support them. And that's exactly what we were able to do. And that's really key to, to remember from the financial standpoint is the citizens really came through and saved us financially in this in this fire. Um, different agencies fed uh, Rolling Stone Pizza came out and served over 260 pizzas. Um, let me tell you, an inmate on a fire crew has never been served a pizza, and they did. They got pizzas, and they were custom pizzas. They want to come back to Sutter County. <laughs> 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 I've talked to the captains, but uh, on, you know, on a lighter note there, but very seriously, the the public and. We have multiple thank yous going out to these people that, um, that that assisted us. We wouldn't have been able to do it without them, and we would not have financially. We would have seen a larger financial hit had we did not get the support from the public. So very important that we recognize uh, our public and how we came together as a community. All right. So so before so we learned some things that night. We learned some things that night, especially me. This was the first incident, real incident, I had gone through here since coming on with the county. Um, I heard all of the stories about the Oroville disaster, but I actually got to live this. So this was a good lesson for me. But first off, we have to just um, acknowledge what went well. And John's talked about it already, but I want to mention it again. It was the cooperation internally and externally. At my level in the EOC, the coordination and the communication is the number one thing that we do. We provide coordination, we provide resources, and technical specialists to the field forces. Um, so when we call, they pay. That's important. Um, I don't know that other, I know that other jurisdictions sometimes have issues with that. So I was happy, very happy with that. Um, our communications with dispatch in those initial hours were critical and those public safety dispatchers were there for me. My only touch to the incident with John for those first couple hours was through a dispatcher. And so that was, that was super um, helpful to me to be able to relay information in our um, operations center and then push it out. The use of the command van was a huge support for John and how fast and quickly that had dispatched from the sheriff's department out to the field was great. And so I think those command van exercises that the county staff have been doing every quarter are well worth uh, their weight in gold. And then uh, we had a lot of support from the city of Yuba City. The city of Yuba City really helped us out a lot. Uh, I know on the fire side they helped out Chief Salowitz and then on my side of coordination of information just to relay what was going on so that they were kept in the loop. And then lastly, as far as what went well for us, and I'm sure there's many more, but I'm just taking some of the highlights, is that coordination and the relationship between uh, Chief Shalowitz and my office. If we don't have that kind of coordination and that relationship building with our field, then I'm not going to be able to do a huge, a good job for the county. It's going to be tougher for me to do. So, um, so those were the lessons, those were the what went well. Um, lessons learned. Um, professional radio communication staff support public safety department. So we have a very intricate radio system here in Sutter County, and I'm gonna let John talk about that. But one of the things that we're need, gonna need to start looking at is to employ somebody that can help us maintain that system. So do you wanna expand yeah. on that? So basically what we did is we took the advantage of this incident to be able to go through an after action report uh, and sat with the department heads that were involved and the major players that were involved within this incident and we were able to take down some things that we learned, uh, some things that went well and things that really didn't go so well. Uh, communications is a challenge. 
Obviously, in an area like the Sutter Buttes, it's very hard. You would think there's a huge radio tower on the top of the Buttes that we would have great communications. We have some of the worst communications once we get into that area. Uh, and where this first, first uh, statement comes out, recruitment needed of a professional radio communications staff, um, we're, we are definitely in need of this. A lot of counties uh, employ a public safety radio communications person. Not necessarily just for public safety, but they do radio communications within the county um, through public works. Anybody who has any type of communication systems, they manage those. Um, we have a very intricate system that's based off of use, which is called the interoperability program. Uh, we can actually talk to any agency. After 9-11, one of the things that came out after 9-11 is that police, fire, uh, emergency services, public works, all that couldn't talk to each other. They were all doing their own thing. And it was anarchy. Whereas we have, we do have that capability to do that. And with that command van that came out, I was able to start patching those things. We did have some issues, had to call more staff in, where if we had this person in place, this would be their job to manage that system. That system is very important also because it allows a lot of us to get grants um, when you have that system in place. When you don't have those types of systems in place, you're not necessarily qualified for a lot of the grants we can look at. Uh, we looked at having a dedicated hotline for the citizens. Uh, we looked at the dispatcher being overwhelmed. We looked at Brenna being all overwhelmed. Um, if anybody in this room tried to call me on my personal cell, I'm sorry, I threw it across my, my truck and I never answered it for two days. And I believe my, within the first hour my phone was full. <laughs> so we see that and we need to find a way to stop that type of communication where we take those communications, not that we don't give information to the public, that we find a place to put that in one central place and we get good information, quality intelligence, not information and not rumors out to the public. Uh, and that's very important that we do that. Yeah. So we're working with IT and that's something that we can do very quickly here. We'll be getting that out and getting that up and running shortly over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the other thing that um, was very apparent to me here is that we need to have more people trained on social media and social media communicators to just monitor the traffic and provide updates. Whether there's anything to update or not, we can say that. We can say, you know, there isn't an update to containment of the fire at this, at this time, but we'll get you an update in the next hour. So Chuck and I are going to be working on that over the next several months to conduct some of that kind of training and then just recruit internally people that we can call into the operations center and come in and just manage social media uh, so that we can provide more information. That's another way to get information out. And in this world today with social media, we have to be in front of it. Um, and then recruitment of field response PIOs. Um, Chuck was in the field early. As soon as we called for him, he was there. Uh, however, we need more PIOs. This was a small incident. If we had another Oroville spillway or if we have floods this winter, we're going to need more people that we can dispatch out to the field. So we're going to look to our public safety departments internally into the county um, and then look at our cities, ask them for people that we can call up and then um, and dispatch out to the field from a public safety standpoint. It's very important that those that respond out the field understand public safety and can speak that language really important for everybody to understand that a lot of these incidents that are going on within the state, each fire has 20 to 30 PIOs on that fire. Um, they are, it's a very, uh, very in-depth, it's something that is now just growing in the public information officer levels of what the information, the public is always more and more demanding. Every time we have more and more emergencies, people want to know. Um, and they always want to know information faster than we can get it out. And there's always a lot of um, questions uh, to the incident of what we need to do. Chuck did a great job. I, I, I owe him an apology because I was not good at getting information to him because I was overwhelmed in the beginning. Uh, but he stood by me and we kept coming up and asking for information and as we got it, we tried to get it out to him as much as we possibly could. Um, did a great job on a field interview with the news. Kept the news off my back. Thank you for that. Um, I was a little overwhelmed. <laughs> but anyway, that public, that field response PIOs is something that we're going to be looking to the other. You don't have to be a fireman. You don't have to be uh, a police officer to do this job. You just have to know how to talk to people. So we're going to be looking to the different divisions to assist us in the emergency management. Because it doesn't have to be just for fires. It could be anything. And then lastly on this one, 
what are the expectations of the staff, so us, from our elected officials ahead of time? Uh, we really want to get that nailed down so that we can meet those expectations moving forward. So we know what you expect from us and, and we can try to deliver that to you. Um, so just uh, to, do you want us to go a little faster? Yeah, right. okay. All right, so I'll cover this a little bit faster. So again, keeping with the theme of getting out information faster to the public, we're working on it. Um, we're getting ready to purchase, execute a contract for an alert and warning system that will help us do that much quicker. If I had had that in the EOC that night, I could have reached out over multiple phone lines, multiple text messages, and notified everybody that there was a situation going on with the units. Um, wildland firefighting potential contract. So one, of, one of the things that we address that is, is we don't have that Cal Fire influence is looking at the possibility and we're going to be entertaining that with our neighboring Cal Fire unit to see what it would do to put a Cal Fire uh, agency agreement to be able to protect the views. Um, that gets us the, the whole gamut of all these PIOs, everything we would need uh, possibly if the, if the wildland uh, situation was to take off in views. Um, we would be able to call to them. It is a financial thing, contract, and we'll have to see what we can go forward with that. And then an approved web presence on our uh, Sutter County webpage, um, an implementation of our GIS, which is Geographic Information System, it's basically mapping. We're gonna put real-time mapping up on our webpage and um, social media so that the citizens are fully aware of what's going on real-time as it as an unfolds. We've already developed that, in fact. And then lastly, we're considering looking at having a, what I'm calling a forward emergency operations center somewhere downtown at our civic center offices. So that if we have a smaller scale incident, we can activate it there rather than going out to Sutter. And so then, the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Goals moving forward. So what can you expect from our offices in the coming year? Um, we're going to do more training. We need to train more people. We need to practice as well. So we're going to do some exercises uh, where we get together and go through a scenario and talk about how we would go through that incident. Um, we talked about the staff. We're updating emergency plans. The plans haven't been updated in this county for several years. So one of the big charges that my office has is to update those plans. Uh, we secured a grant with the Department of Water Resources uh, for about $800,000 and we'll be kicking off that project later on this year to work on flood response planning and also there's an evacuation planning component to that um, and then also flood fight with our reclamation districts so to improve those relationships on how we're going to respond to flood disasters and then just continued relationship building within the operational area uh, when I got here, one of my first charges was that we need to build relationships with our partners, and I think we're doing that. Uh, we work very closely with Uva City um, right now, and they're, they've been a huge asset to us. And so there we go. That's the presentation. If anybody has any questions, obviously we're pushed for time here today. Feel free to contact me or Brenna at our offices, and we're happy to sit down and discuss. Any questions from the board? Yes, we have some questions. Mm -hmm. Chair. Um, First of all, I'd like to commend both of you uh, on, I think it was a first class operation myself. I mean, yeah, but there's some uh, issues that we need to address and you as professionals will address those uh, within the county. But one of my biggest questions is that, you know, I've seen the fire. With all the communication towers uh, that are up there on top, is there, do we ever have any uh, preventative maintenance programs uh, that will clear all, any of that stuff around there and say, hey, if it burns up there, it's not going to touch those towers at all? So um, that is a privately owned uh, area up there, home to tour communications. Uh, in great communications with Jay Clay, who runs that from the Calusa area, he was actually there at the fire, uh, very appreciative of how we, what we did not do damage. We did very minimal damage to the towers. Uh, actually, it was more like we burnt up some railroad ties that were, uh, that's really what we burned. And some very minimal damage to some uh, internet stuff that was up there. Um, yes, I discussed that with him. And we're gonna be moving forward with a plan to actually get some uh, wildland clearance around those. Uh, it's a very challenging site. It's, it's the back side of it is a cliff. Uh, to get it clean, people have to go on ropes and, and use chainsaws. And it's 
it, it's going to be a very hard project, but yes, Jake is, is willing to work with us to make sure we can get those towers protected. I've got any fire, because, you know, the majority of us have lived there a long time. The dudes burn all the time. Yeah. But is there any uh, fire outreach that goes on with the, the citizens that live out in the dudes that have homes? Do we often go out there and say, hey, you might want to clear this area just in case there's a brush fire again? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the staff, my staff, goes out and does weed abatement. Uh, they do go out on complaints and they also do education on that. Um, we can look to address that at a, at a better level, especially in the views. And really doing that public outreach uh, will help, obviously, once we start moving forward with uh, our alert and warning system, we're gonna have a very large media release when we do that. And I think that's gonna be a perfect time for us to get the, that information out to the public. One other way we're gonna be able to do that is we're gonna be updating our local hazard mitigation plan. And mitigation is basically prevention of our priority hazards in the county. And those kinds of projects, um, will be in there and that plan is approved by the board public information projects weed abatement projects uh, fire uh, 100 foot defensible space projects will be in there that you guys will actually get to review and approve so obviously we've uh, faced in the last couple of years uh, you know an evacuation of oil dam and, and uh, situation here with the new uh, fire uh, can we see how other counties or what other counties do for prepare to prepare for you know emergency situations uh, you know according to the schools we always uh, have fire drills earthquake drills intruder drills and stuff like that so you know what are other counties going to uh, you know that will, will benefit us to, uh, to look at being better prepared for the next time yes absolutely and that that is our goal to make sure we this was an eye-opener uh, for me I know uh, how we operate at our levels and we are challenged as I said unlike other counties and we do have our own special challenges within the county uh, but we saw an incredible support Cal Fire has reached out to help me to come up with different uh, answers for that and how we can get through that and how other counties are doing it uh, working with the different fire chiefs uh, locally uh, great support obviously from Sacramento, Sacramento City, Sacramento County uh, we have great support all over and they are willing to help us with everything. Um, with that DWR and that mitigation stuff that we're going to be working on through the grant, um, we'll see a lot of that. A lot of that will come forward. Um, well, and then at my level, I work with all the surrounding emergency managers, attend their trainings, attend their meetings, their exercises, and so we share best practices all the time. Um, so we'll be implementing things that I'm seeing happening in Sacramento or in Yolo County and put them into play here through our planning, training, exercise, through our whole program. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, before to add to that, um, interesting that Brenda, John, and I have been talking about doing a mock exercise and that uh, we're trying to figure out the right time to do that. And then we had this real uh, life event. So uh, we have done training uh, with Yuba City. Uh, we did one recently, a few months ago. Uh, we had uh, also one before that with the elected officials uh, training that took place. So it's on our to-do list. This was a really good exercise for us, but we'll definitely put that in our to-do list and we'll share with the board. We'll have a couple trainings over the next year. So I'll commit now that we do that. We'll do a simulation. What's that? Our schedule. Our schedule. Sim simulated exercises are key. And we're also going to take a look at the buffer question. Supervisor like Whitaker raised. Now, many counties and cities do have buffers. Uh, we don't care, so we'll take a look at that. Yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, I like uh, Supervisor Whitaker was saying <coughs> control of uh, vegetation around those tower areas would be great. You know, maybe a crew could bring a, a group of sheep up there or goats to work that brush and stuff down on an ongoing basis, keep it away. And, and also, I must commend everybody. I think everybody did a fantastic job. Um, considering the whole state was burning at the time, to get resources in here was absolutely incredible. So I think it could have been a really different picture. And I don't know where you found it, but you got it. <laughs> Under a rock, somewhere, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yes, we got, we got great support. So a couple of comments from me too. I'd really like to commend you on a job well done. It was. Uh, you know, I know it was a little hairy in the beginning as things were getting started, but you got it well under control. And the, once the information did get out, then it started coming out. And 
you know, just knowing that you control the fire and you know, put it out within a short period of time. Um, I, I look forward to uh, supporting you and thanking others for the resources as well. So if there's anything you need from us in terms of thanking the outside agencies, the, the other county departments that got involved, which we saw everything coming to the table. And it was, it was great to see all that activity and especially the private citizens who didn't jump up. I know, I know Brenna, you called one and got her out of bed. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember hearing that, but it's, it's like knowing that those resources come together and they're there. And I think this was, you know, uh, a good practice exercise and it was real, but you know, knowing that we can handle much larger issues and that how to approach those issues is really good. Uh, one question I did have is that I know that in Sonoma County, they have a uh, fire symposium that's being sponsored by the uh, by the county. I'm not sure which departments, but probably fire. Um, so I don't. Maybe you can take a look at how they're doing that, but they're speaking actually more to the public in terms of how to control um, fire issues. You know, how to prepare for disaster in general, and they're in, they're pretty actively involved. I know there's some supervisors also working with them on that. So uh, maybe we can take a look at something like that. I think you had some plans already working with the public, but I'd like to see more of like a town hall mm -hmm. sort of uh, environment, maybe one per district or something where you talk to groups of uh, public and let them know in terms of disaster preparedness. Because we're coming off the big evacuation where everybody was still wondering, you know, which way do we, which way do we drive out? What do we do? And there was a lot of panic involved. And then, so that, you know, that panic still is lasting. And we, we noted that as, as, the, as the fire was taking place, you know, not only was your phone full, but our phones were filled, right? So we got all these calls and we didn't know, we, didn't, we gotta know what to do with them. And I think it'd be great if we can inform the public and keep them going. And uh, it, I'm glad to hear about the practice scenarios. And if we can just share with the public even more, uh, we can do that. So thank you. Absolutely. Great job. Mm -hmm. Chair. Yes, sir. Yeah. At one time, Chief Salvage, uh, up there in the bus, we used to spray actually up to the fence line. I noticed there was an awful lot of grass clear up to the road now. Maybe we can help a little bit of that by, you know, roadside spraying. But also at one time, uh, the landowners were responsible for disking along the fence on their side, at least the two disks with. Yeah, so that, that disk line was in place. Uh, this fire moved right through that disk line. Uh, it was just a roadside start and didn't make it past that. It, in fact, it, burned, it started right at a gas well, so there was a large gravel area where it started and the fire had enough potential and it went around. So it, they, there was some effort made, but yes, I do agree with you, there can be a better weed abatement project put into the buttes to be able to get road, stop that roadside starts, and kind of like the uh, surprise or whatever state. Okay, any other comments from the board? Okay, thank mm -hmm. you very much, appreciate right. it. Thank you. I'd like to give you guys a hand, actually, for the... Um, we're going to take a five-minute break, Scott. No boss. All right, five minutes. <laughs> Other than that microphone, there's no other microphones, and we are recording the meeting, so just want to let everybody know. Thank you. Mr. Chair, before we're going to move into the next subject, which is homelessness, but before we do that, one uh, final thought on the fire incident. It's if you stop and think about it, we are a rural fire department with a limited number of paid firefighters. And, you know, we have some issues with that, we're working our way through that. But up until the last couple of decades, it was all volunteers. So if you look at how far this county has evolved and what is expected of our fire, fire personnel, they are expected to do way more than they're able to deliver. So we appreciate the relationship with the City Fire Department and our Urban Fire Department and the other departments uh, around us. But I'm real proud of the fire chief and what they were, what they're able to do on such a small shoestring budget. It's truly really amazing. So having said that, I'm going to ask uh, Scott Thurman to our our housing consultant to uh, come talk to you about the current state of homelessness and as a reminder we will be in front of the board I believe on September 11th or it's not that date it's coming up when we'll get back to you on the update on the long-term homeless management plan as well as you know, your citizen committee and all the work they've done and their recommendation 
on um, the site for a temporary housing shelter uh, facility. So having said that, I'll turn this to uh, Scott to come up and give his presentation. Thank you. Mr. Chair and uh, board members, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to briefly share with you uh, where things are. Speak right into the mic. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. I'm briefly share with you today um, regarding homeless management. And if you have questions as we go along, you'll be sharing a good deal of information. If you have questions as I'm going over each slide, just feel free to, to speak up at that point. Uh, again, quite a bit of information. So just wanted to share with you a few activities um, that we've been involved in over the last uh, year. And um, as you can see here with the overview, we've been um, working on developing a shelter concept uh, to serve the Southern County homeless population. And uh, we've also been providing um, staff support to the ad hoc shelter uh, location site review committee, and uh, as well as the uh, bi-county committee um, on homelessness and uh, as, as well as the uh, Sutter County staff as well. So um, within this process, we've been facilitating regional cooperation uh, for homeless planning, and uh, we've been also supporting local partnerships uh, for services, and that's been a very important component as well. And then um, we've been identifying and securing um, funding sources um, for homeless services and also for shelter construction, and I'll talk uh, more about that in detail. And then um, we've been um, working on, we're, we're, we're beginning to formulate the long-term homeless management plan, um, and uh, there's a few um, items within that that develop, development services, services we'll talk about in detail. Um, so we'll let them talk about that at a later point. So the ad hoc committee um, summary, um, What's happening with the ad hoc, ad hoc committee? Uh, most of the committee members uh, decided to continue on after the selection of a site. And uh, there was one committee member that decided to, to no longer participate. Um, but we have, a, we have a very good committee, very smart committee, um, intelligent. Um, they are balancing um, the needs of the community with uh, compassion for the homeless population. And um, so we're glad to continue on with them and get their input. Uh, we had a meeting in July, um, and that committee meeting, um, uh, the highlight of the committee meeting was development services. They shared about both uh, potential sites, uh, the behavioral health site, as well as uh, Black Titans Church parcel. And um, the conclusion was that the Glad Tidings location um, really has some significant infrastructure and zoning issues. Um, and one of the LIBO community members actually brought that up and uh, mentioned that during the meeting. Um, and so the determination was that it's, it's best to go with the behavioral health location as far as a potential temporary and maybe permanent shelter site. And, um, and so that was the conclusion of the ad hoc committee. And then um, within this, um, the considerations um, from the decision of the ad hoc committee moving forward uh, for the supervisors to consider is um, should we move forward with the 1965 libel location as a temporary um, sh shelter site and um, should we uh, actually within that should we move forward with it as a permanent site as well and then also um, should we have tough sheds at that site or tents um, the configuration of the site and the operations will be different accordingly, uh, according to what we select within that. Um, and then also, I'll talk a little bit, a little later, about um, the regional shelter concept. Um, and this is a, this is a new concept that's come on that's come on the scene within the last couple of weeks. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the the tent option. Um, this would be 12, uh, five 12 person tents um, with accessory units um, that would be made available for the home, homeless population. Uh, so, simple configuration within that. And this has the, the, the breakdown on that. And development services during their time, we'll talk about that in more detail um, as far as how this site would be configured. And then also there's the tough shed option, and this would be very similar to um, the 14 Ford site in the city. And we're talking about 32 person structures with accessory units. You would count. Excuse me, you would count. You would count. 
And this, you can see the configuration of that particular site as well. And then operations, um, that's yet to be determined. Uh, we've had some dialogue with the Salvation Army regarding the operations of the site along with Hands of Hope. And, um, but what we have um, been in uh, contact with Hands of Hope uh, concerning is uh, they operate the coordinated entry location within the Yuba City. And um, operationally, what we're looking at is during the daytime, uh, homeless individuals would be at the coordinated entry location. And if you remember, originally we talked about a 24-7 concept at a particular site. So if we're able to have um, homeless individuals at the coordinated entry site Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, uh, that would save a significant amount of general fund money um, for the proposed project. Um, so we've got a verbal commitment within that. We'll need to solidify that in the future. Um, there might be some cost to this particular option, but again, this will be much less than um, the concept of 24-7 on site. And then, um, as, as you are aware, well aware of, there's been regional collaboration um, with um, homeless services and homeless planning. Um, the Bi-County Homeless Services MOU team um, has been very active in meeting on a monthly basis. And uh, what we've seen within that process is a, a, an increased level of cooperation and planning within both counties and the jurisdictions as well. Um, right now, there's a significant amount of momentum um, as it relates to homeless planning and homeless uh, services. Um, in fact, um, we are in process of um, developing a homeless strategic plan. Uh, that particular plan will likely be available um, at the end of the year, um, but that's in process. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a consensus to pursue um, a regional shelter concept, and this is being led by the Salvation Army. Now, this is a little bit of a challenging scenario because um, which one do we uh, which one do we pursue? Do we pursue the Live Oak location, um, or do we pursue this regional shelter concept? Um, those that are planning out the regional shelter concept, um, what I have instructed them um, as far as planning is that if they head down this path, they need to head down it very quickly and they need to identify a viable site. And as we know within the circumstance, within uh, the selection of, of uh, regional shelter, shelter site, the location is going to be key as far as um, you know, the viability of it. And um, so Salvation Army is leading that process and um, they are currently in discussion um, regarding a couple of sites. The primary location they're looking at at this point is um, their current depot location, um, demoing that site and um, creating a um, larger shelter location um, for singles and some families. And um, also coordinated entry will be located at that location as well. Um, so the Salvation Army is in the process of presenting that concept to Yuba County and then um, um, after that to uh, marriage as, as possible. Okay, funding. So this is a very unique time in homeless um, services and, and funding um, availability. Um, I think I might have shared before that um, no other time in my 25 years have I seen this much funding as it relates to homeless services <coughs> at the state level. Um, and I'll talk about the detailed um, funding sources that are available. And then we are also dialoguing with um, some of the local foundations um, as far as funding um, different homeless initiatives, and we'll talk about that um, as well coming here. So one of the major sources we are looking at at this point in time that you're aware of is No Place Like Home. Um, the um, No Place Like Home is um, over $2 billion in funding from the state of California for permanent supportive housing. Uh, for the homeless mentally ill. And um, as you are aware of, um, the, there's an allocation of um, $1 million to Sutter and Yuba County um, for a 40 unit project. And that, that will be allocated to the 40 unit project um, being facilitated by the Regional Housing Authority. And then we are also looking at, uh, in Marysville, the Espanol uh, Motel, which is um, 14 studio units. And the idea is to start small and then um, for each of the four rounds, pursue a permanent supportive housing project. Um, and we haven't identified the additional locations at this point, but that's the plan at this, uh, at 
construction. And then the HEAP program is a new funding, funding source. It's a one-time funding source um, coming to the region. Uh, it'll be in the amount of 2.6 million. And, um, and that, will, that can be used for shelters, um, what they're calling navigation centers, which is basically a coordinated entry type, one-stop location. And then coordinated entry itself, um, those are the eligible uses. Um, this funding will be coming through the Southern Yuba Homeless Consortium. Um, but the state is expecting that the consortium uh, works in conjunction with the jurisdictions on the site and how to utilize this funding. Um, so um, this, what's been dialogued about so far within this is that, is, is a scenario where um, we would look at increasing the overall number of shelter beds in the region. And again, that can be done by a regional project, um, but also um, we can look at individual shelter sites as well, and reno renovation projects and new construction projects. Um, within that. And this is a, a also a new funding source, Kesh. Um, Kesh is uh, going to be a combination of two one-time funding sources to um, Sutter and Yuba County. Um, we don't know the exact amount um, available, but I'm guessing somewhere in the three hundred to six hundred thousand dollar range. And um, and this money can be used for a variety of different ser services listed below there. Uh, on an ongoing basis, Sutter County can apply um, after the two um, allocation rounds. Sutter County can apply for additional funding um, at the uh, at the state level. Um, this funding source works much like um, the Balance of State CDBG program, uh, where you can apply and we'll, we'll be competing statewide for this funding. So that's a resource that you can use to address homelessness within the region. And then Housing for Healthy Families, this is a new source. We don't know much detail um, about this particular um, funding source, um, but it's going to be, it's going to be focused on um, supportive housing um, and it's going to be grants and loans and combinations. So I think it's going to work in conjunction with um, No Place Like Home. And then the CalWorks HSP, and this is and this is important to note. So CalWorks, CalWorks HSP is a is a current current existing funding source um, that Sutter County receives funds for, and it focuses on rapid rehousing for families. What's important to note about this is, as we are talking about the shelter and shelter concept, um, we really should be focusing on singles primarily. And, and the reason why is, is, is that the CalWorks, CalWorks uh, HSP program will, the funding is going to increase and there's going to be sufficient funding to house families to put them in motels temporarily and then um, help them seek housing overall. So, if we look at shelter, we really should look at families going into motels, but singles being in some type of um, overall shelter building. And then we're also pursuing Medi-Cal funding, um, and this funding will be um, utilized uh, for homeless case management, um, and it's likely that case managers will be located at coordinated entry. The way we're um, structuring things regionally is that Case management won't need to take place at um, court at um, the shelter locations. All case management and client assistance in that manner will take place at coordinated entry. So these case managers will be embedded by at coordinated entry. And then also, where um, we've been in dialogue with Adventist Health, Adventist Health is um, is um, looking to be a strong partner as it relates to homeless services um, within. Um, Southern and Yuba County. Um, we had a very good meeting with them, um, uh, with their CEO and one of their administrative staff. And, and in my sense within this is that as far as um, homeless planning and homeless services, we're going to have to keep up with the CEO. Um, he's that aggressive when it comes to um, wanting to address homeless services, um, homelessness within the region. Um, and this can be um, combined with a um, New state, so we have a concept, let me back up a little bit, we have a concept of a regional homeless outreach team. And this is really going to be a foundational component for us. Um, we're looking at a scenario where we have a, 
a strike team that would include uh, law enforcement and, um, and social services and case managers that um, if you have homeless client A who's out on the street, um, this team would go and engage that individual and let them know their options. Uh, and of course the option would be, um, one of the options would really not include staying at that particular location. So this is going to be a very um, foundational, um, very important component that's foundational. Um, the plan is also that this team would address um, homeless individuals that frequent uh, the Adventist Health location in um, the emergency room. So this will be a win-win scenario for Adventist. Um, so they're looking to invest in this. And again, we can use state funding to um, enhance that program as well. And then, um, And then also Southern Medical Foundation, we've been in dialogue with the Southern Medical Foundation. We're, we're unsure exactly how they want to invest, but we get the sense that they do want to invest in homeless services within the region. And um, we are going to be submitting to them an application for the temporary shelter location and also for expanding of coordinated entry. Um, what's important with them is though, is that um, we're sure that Southern Medical Foundation, um, they might fund, um, these activities, but they're also going to want to see a permanent option um, as part of the overall plan. Uh, so if we approach them, we want to have an idea of how we're going to address um, the shelter option on a permanent basis. And then conclusions um, and suggestions. Um, my, uh, our, our team's suggestions are that we continue to um, um, continue to pursue uh, the state and local funding sources. Um, as I mentioned, there's a good amount of momentum going at this point in time, so we want to pursue those sources and plan services. And, um, and we believe it's essential to continue to participate in the regional planning, planning process through the bi-county team. And, um, and then also looking at developing a temporary shelter option. And it's likely um, with what we're looking at as options, whether it's the live oak location, the current building, are a regional option. It's, it's, it's appearing that we are going to need to operate the temporary location for at least two years. Um, and then um, perhaps move into a permanent location at that point. And so uh, within this, we also want to consider that the permanent regional shelter option are, um, are the, the, uh, the local option when it comes to a potential shelter site. Um, and then our overall plan is on uh, at the September 11th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, we'll, we'll um, present the long-term homeless plan at that point, and then also the tempor temporary site, uh, site uh, shelter, excuse me, the temporary homeless shelter site recommendation. I'm gonna get it out of there. All right, so um, any questions? Yeah, we'll back to the board, yes. Uh, what is your estimate now in total homelessness? You know, um, when we look at um, coordinated entry, um, off the top of my head, I remember the numbers um, that coordinated entry is serving within the region, about 800 um, who are accessing. Um, Is that with both counties or just? That's with both counties. Okay, both counties. Yeah, and, and uh, coming up, we'll, we'll be doing a full count in January of um, this upcoming year, so we'll have a better sense of the, the, number, the overall numbers in January 2019. So, the site we're looking at, about the area, the You know, it, it, that's, a very, that's a very good question. So. If we're, if we're looking at um, numbers, um, my estimate is this, is that once we develop a, a shelter plan, whether it's regional or within Southern County, um, that we can get up to somewhere around 250 shelter beds um, within the region. I believe somewhere between um, 250 to 300 is where we want to be. Um, there's, there's no region or no jurisdiction that actually has a, enough shelter beds for all of their homeless population. Um, and so I think if we get to that point, we can create an overall system that moves individuals to the shelter through coordinated entry and then hopefully through permanent, uh, to permanent housing. Okay. Chair. Um, so 
Let's, let's take this in half and say that the Sutter County shares 400 in population, and the Sutter County shares probably 400 as well. And, and you, you stated that uh, you know the goal is not to we're not putting the the house or uh, five bedroom space for for, for 400 people. Um, so my question is like in our regional collaboration, you know. And I, and I believe this is the best way to, to address it because uh, I'm looking right at you, Mr. Gale, is that the city of Yuba City and, and Sutter County and uh, the city of Marysville and uh, Yuba County, we have to address these on a regional basis because all we're doing is pushing these homeless people to different areas that we don't address the issues. Uh, either they're going to come, obviously they, they now come over to Sutter County side because Sutter County has not able to enforce our, our current, current uh, ordinances. And so, but eventually we are going to enforce those ordinances and hopefully we'll enforce those in a regional capacity uh, along with uh, Yuba County and, uh, and the city of Yuba City. Uh, so, currently, just from your slides is that, you know, we have two million in funding for no, no places like home, uh, two million in 2.6 million in, in the heat project, and the cash is uh, close to 300,000. Uh, how much more money do I have to keep flowing at this site? I mean, to, to, in order to make a difference, you know? I mean, that's a lot of money to, to be looking at to, to throw against homeless people. When the state of California basically tells me that I only have to provide a place of rest, all right? I don't have to provide a shelter. I don't have to provide uh, a tough shed. I don't have to provide bathroom services. I just have to provide a place of rest. And so my biggest question is, is that if we're looking at a place of rest, and obviously the LIBO is very conducive uh, to what we want to create, uh, why wouldn't we just create a minimal place of, of saying, hey, here's your place of rest. Possibly throw some uh, affordable bathrooms out there and call it good. You know, you know that's, that's a very good question. Huh? Let me see if I can answer this uh, carefully. You know, when we're, when we're looking at an overall homeless plan, we're, we're looking at um, the homeless population and the needs of the homeless population and the best interests of the community. And I, and I think I, I'm trying to just repeat that over and over again because that is, that's the mindset that we have. And um, having a scenario where um, there are no services and it's just a location where individuals can rest. I would argue that that's not in the best interest of the community at all. Um, that it's in the best interest of Sutter County to help homeless individuals address um, their current needs and move them towards permanent supportive housing. And and I'll be honest within within that um, within this is you know it when you have your average homeless individual. That homeless individual might go all the way through the system and then maybe two or three years down the road might have to go through the system again. That's just the reality of, of homelessness. Um, but if we, if we create an overall system where we're addressing um, the needs of individuals and, and also having a level of accountability, um, that is, that's going to be the best, the best approach for Sutter County. Mr. Thurman, obviously you're the expert on um, this homeless issue, and I am not. I'll be the first one to tell you that. But my understanding is, with regards to the majority of the homeless people population, they basically want to be left alone and on their own uh, living conditions. Now you're telling me that you know, if we create a, a bed space of, of, of let's say 60 to 90 beds, that we're going to have a fraternity of homeless people that are all going to sleep together and, and, and be together. I don't, personally, I just don't see that. But, uh, you know, and, and I could be wrong, and that's why I, I have to leave you, uh, to you to, to educate me, to uh, help, help me understand. So if you could explain that in more detail, so you're thinking just, that... You know, with the homeless people that we have uh, along the road box, they're not all together in the same spot. They're not making that, you know, uh, Ten cities and, and, and collaborating on, on, on different areas. 
they're pretty spread out along those riverbanks. And so uh, they don't seem to be wanting to uh, be all together in the same area. They might be in the same area to, uh, to uh, gather services as far as food and resources, but they're not going to go uh, you know, sleep in, a, in, in, in structures together, in tents together, in one big tent. And I don't see that. I could be wrong. I was, like I said, educate me on this and, and help me understand. The way I would answer that is, is, is in this manner. Um, overall, what we're trying to do is, is change the paradigm of homelessness. And and you're right, within the region, um, your average homeless individual is accustomed to living in a tent or, you know, when, I, when I'm saying shanty type structure and um, making their way on a daily basis by whatever means. Um, what we have to do message wise and that involves services, that involves ordinances, is send the message that this is what it means to be homeless in Southern County. If you are homeless in Southern County, the expectation is that you're going to engage in services. Um, now, there might be individuals who take a while to engage in those services, but that's going to be the expectation. We're going to have a system set up where um, coordinated entry services will be available to you, which include life skills, um, rapid rehousing, a variety of different services. And the expectation is that we want you to move towards permanent housing. There is a portion of the population that would choose and would likely to con continue to try to choose to live their current lifestyle, but we have a chance to create a framework where that homeless individual, that this is really the best choice that they can make and that they can see that choice. Um, and, and just a little side note, we're dealing with that, we had that dialogue, we had a coordinated entry meeting this morning where we had that dialogue, where we said, hey, we're setting some framework, um, rules and guidelines within this process that every individual has to follow um, and, and has to proceed, uh, proceed forward with. So that's important to know that we have that framework in place already, but we need to continue to send that message uh, to the homeless population. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> to the chair. Yes, sir. <coughs> Scott, thank you for giving us an overview of, of uh, some of the problems that we face. Uh, my question it, it concerns <laughs> Once we have, I, I think a couple of them. I think that it's natural to assume that the people that are homeless should, not necessarily do, but should want to work themselves out of that situation that they find themselves in. But my question, I guess, is that in light of the sympathetic federal judges, et cetera, that, that seem to come down in favor of, of uh, helping uh, maintain that kind of lifestyle what do you see how are we able to uh, uh, monitor and or encourage those people that have chosen that lifestyle that expect us to keep them warm in winter and feed them and, and to take care of them but they want absolutely no restrictions no rules no anything i mean is there some way that you believe we can thin the herd so to speak so that they should, everybody, we, we assume they should be wanting to improve their life, their status in life. But I, I just have a feeling that there's a certain percentage, maybe 20% or more, that say, just leave me alone. Feed me, clothe me, let me take advantage of all the benefits. But I'm going to stay here and live the way I want to live and I don't want any rules. Uh, is there some way that you believe we can get around enforcing that? We have, I mean, if, if we have enough shelter beds as we uh, are aware of, um, we can have a robust enforcement in the home. And, um, and if you talk to the service providers out there, they're in agreement with that particular setup. And, um, and just a side note, you know, when, I, when I speak with the service providers, um, you know, they sometimes don't like what I have to say. Because um, what, I, what I'm saying and what I am sharing with them, and, and this happened at this morning's meeting, is that when we consider homelessness in Southern County, we have to consider, again, what's happening with the community and the homeless population. And we've got to create a win-win scenario. Um, in my 25 years of homeless services, in the various jurisdictions I've worked in, 
I have seen numerous win-win scenarios. Um, and um, personally, um, I believe in services. I believe in compassion. I also believe that there needs to be guidelines. And, um, and so if we have a combination of a services component and ordinances, um, I think you'll find that, that um, as it relates to homeless services, you'll see a major improvement. Well, I just maybe would comment, John. Thank you for your time. Um, I think because of the court act, we have no choice. We've got to move forward with a homeless shelter of some sort, so we can down the road enforce our no camping orders that will have to be redrawn, and they will either move on or move on to the homeless shelter and get services. Uh, and I think that's a, I think that's a, a fair assessment, and uh, I think that's the overall expectation. So I have a comment, and then uh, you have a comment, Mr. Mitten. After look, we'll, let me, we'll let you wrap it up. That. Um, but first, I want to say thank you for your report. Secondly, I remember we were being here last year talking about homelessness, and even though it's a painful subject for everybody, right? You made a lot of progress. I mean, we've made a lot of progress. I've seen so much activity. I've been involved in those meetings, so there's a lot happening in the background. The time it takes is always frustrating, uh, but I feel like foundationally, we've come to a new place, and it's hard for everyone to see that at the moment, uh, as we see an expansion throughout the community of, of the homeless, uh, homelessness. But I think with this foundational structure coming about, you know, it seems solid with, some, with the, some of the funding that's coming from outside resources that's not here, with the other resources coming together. There's definitely been a huge improvement in working together with you know, Yuba County and Marysville and the city of Yuba City. Um, the progress in that one year period you know, for me, coming from private sector, it's really slow, but watching the <laughs> progress, you know, at least it's something occurring, and it's going in the direction I think um, it's there. What I want to encourage, though, is because it's what's, what I've struggled with is, like, understanding what the measurable outcomes will be from those resources so that we have a clear expectation of what, this is how much it's going to cost, this is what the resource is being utilized, and these are the outcomes we can say to the public and to ourselves that these outcomes occurred, so we know that it was worth the investment. Uh, because right now, that's the kind of, I think if you listen to comments, it's challenging to say, well, hey, we keep on bringing this and doing that, but okay, but wait a minute, where, what, what is the specific goal? You know, I mean, uh, you mentioned you know, changing the paradigm of homelessness. You know, I'm not sure that's everyone's goal, and I'm not sure how to, how to measure that. You know, so, but if you can put that down, it's like, here's how we're going to measure that we actually change the paradigm of homelessness. You know, that would be a very critical component for us so that we can say that we, we did make a difference. But I do see the difference. I want to say, you know, being involved is, I know I've been very involved in a lot of those discussions you brought up, and uh, I want to be involved to help make those changes. So, but I appreciate that. But I want to encourage you to look for, you know, measurable. set, yeah, measurable. Yeah. And, and, and I'll mention very briefly on that we, we have a, a data system that is designed yes. to um, to track those measurables and, and so that process is taking place already and, and again the focus is on rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing and um, moving folks into that. Yeah, that's the that's the expectation. Thank you. And then Scott, you want to come in? Can I ask a question? Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Well, Mr. if you don't mind, uh, Nate had a couple of comments. I, I was wondering if I can ask a question. I, oh, I don't know how it works here, like, you know, members of the public. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my, I'm a numbers guy, right? So I, I just wanted to ask a question of Scott. So if we have, um, Jim asked the question about the bi-county area, 800 total. Let's say that Sutter County is 400. And let's say uh, of the 250 beds, 125 are the Sutter County side, right? 250 total beds, 800 total population or, or so. I'm just wondering, in terms of implementation, if you have 125 beds with 400 people down at the river bottoms, how do you 
how do you say we have a place for you to go so you can't say no to us, you can't stay here any longer, but at the same time we don't have enough. In other words, why aren't we seeking 400 beds for 400 people? That, that, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I don't think there's any way to attempt. I mean, it would be nice to have um, a thousand beds available. Um, you know, economically, that's just not feasible. Um, within this, the, the, the homeless, the homeless population is very unique in that they there are patterns to ac accessing services, and it's it's not going to be a scenario where I mean, there there might be some that choose to to move on, um, but. Even if we have services available and ordinances, there are going to be some that are not going to access access services immediately. Um, so I, I think a good baseline number is is that 250. If we had if we had more than that, it would be, it would be much better. But you know the reality is, is I think that's the number we can get to when we consider all the different factors. All right, thank you, uh, Scott. You have some comments. Chair, okay, members of the board, let's wrap this up. Uh, I would like to thank Scott Thurman and his staff. The, the Great, they're a great partner, and they're providing a, a good regional perspective. So we're working very well with other local governments. So um, a, a few wrap-up comments here. So this uh, homeless issue is perhaps Yuba City and Southern County's greatest challenge, and it's a situation that is um, the numbers are rising and the uh, impacts of homelessness are becoming greater and greater. How many meetings have we been in with, with potential developers, for example, business people, property owners? and many of them are sort of giving up. So we, we owe it to them to turn the tide and, and make it an attractive place to, to invest. So we're working very hard, and that's why it's one of our top priorities. That's why we're talking about it today. And um, it's a profound challenge. We also are suffering from the lack of redevelopment agencies. When redevelopment agencies did a good job historically in producing affordable housing. Uh, so that, that's a challenge for us. We're trying to backfill those dollars to make this work. We're moving. We are making progress. We're getting there. The citizens' community has been outstanding, even though they don't meet on a regular basis. They, there's still email communication, and the, and the sharing of ideas has been um, outstanding. So they've, they've done a really uh, good job with that. So the question about the uh, the housing um, units um, is a combination of temporary and permanent housing units that will be necessary to deal with this. We don't necessarily have to provide housing to cover all those that are homeless, because it's at a point in time when they are homeless that they'll need help. We don't want to be in the business of having to have you know, housing people for their entire lives. We're looking at sort of getting them um, off the streets and getting them um, transitioned to something better. So we'll know the sweet spot once we get to it, but we just don't know how many we have to build. We'll start slowly and see where we go. Remember, we're, we, we are very concerned that we'll get in over our heads and we can't handle it. So we're going to go incrementally a little bit and see what we can do. There's a closed session tomorrow at the beginning of what? Uh, the board meeting dealing with the, uh, the lawsuit issue of both Yuma City and, and Sutter County have lawsuits against us over this issue. So we're going to provide the board an update where we are and how that's moving forward. And then um, on 9-11, we'll have the, um, the update on the long-term man uh, homeless management plan as well as the temporary shelter location site that we've heard about. And then finally, we will be more than happy to provide performance measures and metrics and regular reports to the board, maybe quarterly. We can do it monthly and we'll do that and we'll work on um, having the metrics that make sense to you and the public and be happy to put it on our web page so the public can track it as well. So if you like, we can um, have Neil Hay come up and do the facilities or we can take a break. His report will be 10 minutes or less. So it'll go pretty quickly. Let's do the facilities. Then. Okay, and then we can break for lunch yeah, at that point. Perfect. So Neil.
So I'll get started. Neil from Development Services here to talk a little bit about camel facilities. Uh, so the packet in front of you and the, the presentation essentially tried to address some of our existing facilities. So what I did is, uh, in conjunction with General Services, uh, Megan and Ken and her staff, uh, Development Services, we work together and uh, obviously I went through their list of a spreadsheet of all the kind of facilities that they essentially have to maintain and provide services at, whether it be a building, landscaping, obviously the computers and the network for IT services. And I know uh, everybody talks about uh, the 30 facilities. Uh, my count was that there actually was uh, 40 sites where there's county facilities. It doesn't include boat launches, doesn't include parks, but actually places where we have structures. Totals just under 400,000 square feet. Uh, so then the kind of the big groups and a little bit of the campus concept. Uh, Health and Human Services has about 15 sites at 140,000 square feet. General government has 20 sites at 150,000 square feet. And then Law and Justice has five sites totaling just under 100,000 square feet. So the numbers. So as far as I know, there's been a lot of talk about essentially facility consolidation in an effort to try to uh, streamline the operations of the facilities, improve services to our customers so they can come to fewer locations in order to uh, have their needs met. Uh, and it certainly would reduce the, the county's operational costs. So for the consolidation, there's matters such as identifying potential property, financial analysis as to how we would pay for it, then proceeding with property acquisition, and then certainly the improvements of the sites. So uh, some of the uh, steps towards consolidation that have taken place is uh, certainly first and foremost 850 Perry Avenue. So in the, uh, the county obviously has bought the, the lease for the site. There's an existing building there, 84,000 square feet. Your board has awarded a design contract of just over a million dollars to a, an architectural firm that's meeting and working with the Health and Human, Her Health and Human Her Services staff, primarily with Nancy and her team, in an effort to identify the amount of space that every department would need and division to relocate. And one of the big challenges that happens, I think you've heard about our building facility group that meets. It's a group of facility department heads and some reps from the CEO's office. Uh, is that we are reliant on the existing square footages that general services keeps for all the various departments. And what we come to find out is that most of the departments are crammed into existing buildings. So that when we then hire an architect in an effort to try to relocate them to somewhere else, uh, we find out that in order to properly service the employees of the county and have the right space available, in order to service the customers, we need more space than we currently have. For example, um, we awarded a design contract to a firm of Nichols, Melberg, and Rosetta out of Chico to design space, ideally to uh, relocate the district attorney and her staff. Uh, she's currently at 8,000 square feet, and she's going to need closer to 14,000 square feet. And that is in an effort, that's not really overly growing staff, but that's in order to be able to conduct her operations and try to consolidate uh, some of her staff that's actually spread in three different locations. So the effort and energy to try to you know, hire consultants, uh, has, and that's why we're moving with the facility master plan, is to try to begin to identify the sites and where we would put staff. So as the Health and Human Services staff have gone through 850 Gray, uh, we've identified the space there, the 84,000 square feet, and what parts of health that could be relocated there, and the, the design is progressing. Uh, you're probably all aware of 680 North Walton. I believe some of you attended it. So that's the site that essentially was an opportunity to relocate some of the Health and Human Services staff from property along Garden Highway to 680 North Walton, which is at the intersection of Bridge and Walton. 17,000 square feet. They have uh, essentially room for about almost 80 employees. I've got an aerial or a picture of it here later that I'll show you. But that was just an effort because uh, one of the reasons you'll see is that so health uh, seems to be kind of the driving force in the county's facility needs and demands with the states that they have to offer or require in order to service their clients. As far as financial analysis, we've awarded two contracts, one to the Cosmont Group and one to k and Public Finance. So Cosmont uh, essentially performed their work earlier kind of as the feed into and feed information to the building group so that we have some idea of land use and to essentially also to validate the county's assumptions uh, and some of the proposed actions that we were taking. 
and then that's led us to meet with Kane and Public Finance, and they essentially are looking at the county's financials. They've uh, had conversations with the CEO's office, with the auditor controller's office, in order to look at, uh, and I'll say health and human services, in order to be able to look at what, what potential funding and financing is available to accomplish a plan to consolidate. Um, I guess I get to be the lucky one that normally comes before you to ask for money to do projects. And uh, it's, so it's always a matter of where is that money going to come from. So k and has a, has a very pivotal role in the, uh, in the sequence of events in that they're, like I say, studying our financials and where we can go in the future. Uh, as far as acquisition, you're aware of the E50 Gray Avenue lease that's been acquired. Uh, you're also aware of the 680 North Walton lease that's been acquired. There's other, you know, I'll say properties that have been ident identified by the facility group uh, that are you know, being considered, uh, and which leads us into having the facility master plan that will be developed and will come before your board in late September in order to award a contract. As far as some, um, as far as some uh, sites where we've had improvements, we've got the uh, the main jail expansion which that project started in June of 2017 construction and it should finish up by ideally January of 19 and the sheriff should be, take possession of all the area by March of 2019. And the picture will show the 1160 Civic Center building tent improvements. So that project uh, has been completed and, and is in operation. The 680 North Walton tent improvements. So essentially that project, uh, 17,000 square feet, about $1.3 million, done in about two and a half months uh, through extensive coordination by General Services, both their IT department and their facility division in order to line up the, the contractors and uh, significant coordination also with the state agencies that provide computer networking to their department. And that was, I believe, one of the first uses now of the, the microwave technology that's being implemented for county facilities as a way to kind of streamline some of the communication to make it more reliable. The 1445 Veterans Memorial Drive tent improvements is being designed, as I mentioned. And then currently we have a contract for the 850 Gray Avenue hazardous material abatement. So as part of that project, your board awarded a contract just under $300,000 because we're having all of the ceiling tiles removed or, and we're having all the floor tiles removed in order, and doing some selective demolition in order to get the project ready for uh, when we do begin construction once the design is complete. So just to give you a broad, real broad picture, so this is an isometric view of the, the sheriff's main jail. Essentially the roofs that are shaded the lighter color, those are the areas that are being added. Uh, on the left, the lower left is the kitchen expansion, then in the middle is the new medical area, and then the other two areas are the men's and women's housing units. Uh, this is a floor plan of 680 North Walton, so this took, uh, this is the second floor, 8,500 square feet that uh, essentially Health and Human Services worked extensively in order to try to work out a cubicle scenario in addition to new perimeter offices for their staff uh, and they made very effective and very efficient use of the space. And uh, it was, I'll say, delivered and occupied on time. It was a very aggressive schedule, but it did happen before uh, June of 2018. And then finally, this is an area of the, of the 850 Gray Avenue site that shows the, uh, the building in green is the, the 84,000 square feet that's been acquired. And then the, the shaded orange portion, portion is the leaf that has been acquired by the county for the property. And then I spoke a little bit about the facility master plan. So the scope of the work is gonna to be to have an architectural firm meet with all the county departments that possibly could relocate in about five years or so. Uh, typically facility master plans are updated every five years. Um, so that will, we're trying to be somewhat uh, modest in our projections. And then additionally, it will rely heavily on the county's potential to fund the ac acquisitions, the design, and the construction. And by doing so, then that will allow us to, to execute the plan. That's it. So is there any questions? Nine and a half minutes. Good job. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, any questions from the board? Yeah,
Thanks. So uh, I just want to make a comment. I want to say great job on getting moving on these things. I know it's been years of discussion on how to bring the facilities together. And again, it's sort of like, for me, a homelessness thing is sort of like the frustration of the time it takes. And, uh, but I, I understand you have to get all the foundational pieces together, the funding and how it all works. Um, is there a projection now uh, in terms of like 10 years from now, what you could think we have 40 facilities now is there a projection that possibly we're going to have 20 or 10 or I think, the, I think the master plan is going to definitely you know give us those answers bring that about to, to some degree i i guess i would caution you so i've read some of the other counties past facility plans yeah and our county has the habit of starting a plan and never following it yes um, and i and i think that's a, you know challenging I, I mean we're not the only jurisdiction that has those issues yeah but i guess that's why i think it's great to have short range and then maybe long range plans and that's why typically they revisit every five years in order to try to stay on track and hopefully the financing and funding opportunities improve. And then uh, Walton was done in uh, two and a half months. So yeah. Congratulations on that. Really good work on everybody's part. So um, you multiply that square footage to the 850 gray, <laughs> should give or take an estimated move-in date, possibly? Uh, frankly, it will depend on funding. Okay. financing next year this year not, not, this, this, not year. this year okay uh, the design hopefully should be complete by the end of this year okay all right any other questions from the board okay thanks for your presentation i appreciate it we're going to take 30 minutes for lunch uh enjoy your lunch and then we'll come back here at 12 45. Okay. mr chair members of the board we're now going to get into the meat of the agenda so we're at the point now where we're going into item number three, the county uh, proposed countywide mission statement, the you know, new customer service velocity goals, priorities, et cetera. So as mentioned at the beginning, the county does not have a mission statement. Typically, an organization with a thousand people would have one. So we don't have one. And one of um, our priority, one of the priorities from the board, part of the priority was to come up with a mission statement. So we've got one here that uh, Growing out for starters, and you'll see if you go into a municipality, private corporation, nonprofit, a hospital, you'll see a mission statement on the wall. Some of our departments have mission statements. <coughs> Some are very complicated. Some are run on sentences. They can have 10, 12 rows of information. They'll talk about being um, open, transparent, progressive, cutting edge, etc., uh, providing excellent customer service, that type of thing. So, in the staff level review, what should we? suggest to the board and based on some of the input you have provided, it really comes down to just a few words. So what's recommended is to provide exemplary countywide public services to a diverse array of residents, businesses, and visitors. We have a large complex organization, uh, 21 units. We do uh, a whole array of services. It's hard to find one mission statement that would cover everything. The underlying comment thread is Describe to be exemplary with respect to the services you provide. So this is a starting point, and it's the board's pleasure. And if you're not comfortable, you could uh, hold off and come back and do this at another time. So it's up to the board. Okay. Uh, the chair. Yes, sir. I'm reminded of that commercial that we're constantly seeing on TV these days, where the guy stands up and the half of the hotel train and says, "Bada boom, bada boom." Uh, how about more for less? It's up to the board. More for less. Service. Who came up with this mission statement, sir? Uh, in our office. So just your office. Uh, I, I, I sent out. Um, I talked to the E team. I reminded them. I gave everybody a chance to come in with a suggestion. So um, we, we did get some. So did so you tell me that the E team had input? Mm -hmm. Who else had to that, That's not it. Mm -hmm. So this is just a starting point. Uh, from my perspective, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a bad uh, mission statement. Just when you're trying to move uh, 
a lot of people in, in a certain kind of direction. Uh, kind of like to see some of our employees uh, have buy-in to it, you know? Uh, and just to be able to say, hey, maybe I can come up with a better mission statement as, as an employee. Uh, you know, and, and allow those employees to have input. I should, should say, is that uh, you know, as an organization, we have, what, 850 plus 900 employees. And so, you know, the E-team obviously is, uh, is a good spot uh, to run things by, but I also want employees to have buy into that and say, yeah, this is us. This is, this is who we are. We can certainly start with this, and there's no hurry here. We can slow it down and we can. Uh, work with the departments to get it out to the uh, employees, get their input, uh, have a, some discussion about it, fine tune it, come back. I just think all, all it would take is, uh, you know, your E-team department heads and elected officials go out within their uh, respective, uh, you know, uh, units and say, you know, what do you think? And, uh, and can you get some more input and some buy-in? Does anybody have any other suggestions? So. Any other? Uh, questions, thoughts. So mine is just so just I guess sort of along the lines of Supervisor Wicker, just in terms of the process for the establishment of the mission statement. Uh, just on some of the other boards I've worked on from my experience, I can just relay that you know we've worked at the same time on our vision statement and our values. You know, and I know that we're working on priorities and norms, um, but I remember them sort of being blended when we were, like we set a vision first, and then we said from that vision, what's our overall mission? And then from that, what is our set of core values that we uh, all agree upon? And it's, it, it kind of blends that way because when you're establishing from feedback from employees and from the leadership team and um, possibly even members of the public that support you know, the development of the mission statement, then you can say, well, you know, what is it that that vision statement, the mission, the values that we're looking to accomplish. I mean, I think you're covering what the county does. And to uh, Supervisor Sullivan's point, the community could easily like, provide exemplary, you know, cost effective county wide public services. You could have that. But I mean, just uh, I think uh, getting that input would be really helpful. But, I don't, but a matter of process, was there a thought of that? Vision coming later or value? I know the core values are a big deal. We are totally. You know, we never talked about it. I it's it's up to the board. Uh, this this is just to get you started thinking about the overall mission or vision or okay. values. So uh, this is not a prescribed formula one size fits all. We're, we're totally flexible. Okay. So I just I guess I'm just used to, and the board is this is like, like, like you said, that we could establish uh, the vision, values, and mission at the same time. Is that common? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Through the chair. Yes. Sir. Uh, I think it's a good start, Scott. I can't believe that Sutter County's been around one of the original counties. We don't have a mission statement. I guess we've never had one. I can't believe that we've never had one all those years. Um, but I think it's a good start. Uh, I think we have such a wide, diverse uh, method of service and everything from the fire. Sheriff's Department, jail, uh, welfare, libraries, museums, on and on and on. Somewhere we're along the line, we've got to talk a little more about the diverse group of services that we provide, too. So, just a, a matter of clarification on that, too. I remember about three years ago establishing a mission statement. So, what? what that was, um, you did that in 2016. That was not so much for the organization, it's more about. It had to do with um, economic development, if I remember. Right? Did somebody have that? I thought it was for the whole board. Um, the board and the, uh, yeah, so I was just wondering what happened to that mission statement. Right, that's on the website. Um, it was promoting, it, it did involve promoting economic development, I remember that. We can certainly incorporate that in. We did look at that, and I'm sorry I don't have that at my fingertips. Because there was a there was a visioning process like in 2016, and that was part of your process and what you're looking for in a county administrator. You were looking at the um, that's right the job yeah. description. And I can visualize it in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't have it here. Reminding that pile over there. But this, 
this is good. So we get we have some clarity. You're interested in having the, yeah. the vision, the core values, and the mission, and getting it from the employees. Yeah, I mean, and definitely examining the mission. I, I, Pretty sure we'll have to go back and check what we adopted, but I'm pretty sure we adopted that mm -hmm. as a mission statement. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to look at, maybe we haven't used it since then, okay. but we need to go back and say, okay, if this is the mission statement, then and maybe we need to tweak it. Yeah, sure. I mean, okay. that would be fine. Okay. Well, good. We have a little bit more clarity. Yeah. And we can certainly uh, come back and do this. There's no hurry. But it, uh, once we get to the point where you're comfortable with the uh, vision, mission, whatever it's labeled, then we will put that on our agendas, our documents, and, and yeah. so it stays with the organization. Well, I see those as two. Maybe you can help me clarify this uh, one, but you know, I, there's always a vision separate from the mission. Right. Establish core values that different organizations um, approach it depending on whether they want the vision, mission, and core values. Sometimes it's just the mission. Sometimes it's the vision. But I wanted to go back to the. Um, uh, question you asked earlier. I remember when I first started working with each of you right. to do the interviews, I used that information that uh, you came up with when you were putting together your different ideas about what you wanted to be as a county, what was important to you, and then I used that information to start framing the questions when I interviewed each of you right. early on. And so in my mind, I remember it being a guiding document to help start moving the organization forward, uh, what you were looking for, what you wanted from uh, your leadership. But I don't remember it being established as, as a firm mission statement. It was more of a guiding document when I read it. So um, you're right, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the county does have a vision statement that was done through that process. Um, Sutter County endeavors to promote innovation in business and industry while embracing community-wide collaboration and preserving the integrity of our rich, diverse, cultural heritage. Right, so I'm that's a vision, yeah. But, for, but it, does it apply to the organization in terms of how we deliver services and that type of thing? So this is an excellent starting point. Right. Um, At least foundational. That was what we built from this. Sounds good. Maybe a combination of both. Yeah. There's no right or wrong way. But I will tell you, it, 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 you get, the dividends are significant once we get to the point of having a one life vision and a mission statement and a customer service philosophy. It's good for the employees. It's good for our image. Excellent. So um, I think the work you do is a combination of employee feedback and uh, new team. And, and then we'll, we'll do it again with the board. Sometime down the road, we'll come back and say, okay, here's what. We're recommending and we'll give you a dance morning we'll share with you and then we'll come back and do it again. Sounds great. So employee um, and employee. Okay. And you might feel the same way about the, the next uh, suggestion. <laughs> In local governments it's common, uh, not necessarily not universal, but common to have a customer service philosophy. Um, this has been found to be valuable in terms of letting your employees know the importance of customer service. So the one that is suggested, treat all county customers, including residents, businesses, other government agencies, and visitors, fairly, objectively, and with respect and dignity at all times. It's hard for us in local government in that we're not driven in the same way as a private corporation is in terms of you know, chasing the customer, and always making the customer happy. We're going through training, we're learning more how to do that. But this was a starting point, and we would be happy to follow your same, the same lead in the direction you just gave us on this and roll it in with the vision and mission statement if you want. Uh, comments from the board? As a merchant in this community for 30 plus years, it was pretty simple to me. You just say to your employees, you treat the people that walk through this door same way you yourself would like to be treated. Pretty simple. Agreed. There's no disagreement. But it helps to have reinforcement of that. And these type of mechanisms uh, have value and work toward that goal. Okay. So okay? Yep. Yeah, any, well, any other comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Just tie it in to what yeah. understood. 
right? Sorry for the small print. So now we're going to shift. We're going to talk about the goals. The bottom line are 10 broad goals. These are not the priorities, but the goals. To get to the punchline here, staff is recommending that we continue the goals as they are and we move into the, the priority. So the goals are, are broad, and there's 10 of A through J, and this is a summary version. The next page has the full, um, the full uh, text for each of the goals. Here are the first five. Now these cover the broad areas uh, on all the departments in, in the organization. The first one, A, provide professional local government leadership. So I don't have metrics for these. We do for the priorities. These are just the underlying statements about the goals of the organization. This is very common. In, in some uh, institutions, especially in the private sector, each goal will have like dozens of objectives. And then you hold your uh, department heads or your business unit leaders accountable in achieving those objectives. Those sort of management by objectives. So if you like, we can go through each one, or we can just acknowledge that they're there. We'll continue them for another year. And we can go into the priorities. So it's the board's prerogative. How would you like to go through the, the goals? Any comments? Okay. Yeah, I think continuation is. All right, we'll spend now more time on priorities. So I'm going to present the priorities quickly in summary format and then in more detail. As a reminder, with priorities, these are policy statements requirements that you want to see the organization achieve during the upcoming year. Now, you can have a prior priority, we're talking about 850 grade average, you can say a, pri a top priority for this board is to get the Health and Human Services building built and open. Now, obviously, we can't do that in one year, but you'll put that on there as one of your top priorities, so we have to make progress during that year to get there. So you can have the same subject that could be on there for multiple years, if it's a, still a top <coughs> priority for the board. Um, last fiscal year, you had 10 of them. There's no magic number. You can have 11, 15. Um, we're going to recommend that you have five. I think in your discussions with Mr. Lopez, you felt that there would be more value in having a smaller number of top priorities. Focus on that. Now, if an item's not on the top five or 10, it doesn't mean it's not important to the county. Obviously, we have hundreds and hundreds of priorities that we're working on with 1,000 employees. Uh, but this is what you're telling the community are are your top items to focus on. Well, I'll just go with the short version. So one through 10, and it's not necessarily an order of importance, although the ones that are higher up get received more votes <laughs> on the, the board, and you, you put them in there, but we make it clear that item one's not more important than seven or 10. So the first one is to prepare a long-term uh, organization strategic plan and employee succession plan. I'll tell you what, I'll go through each one to give you a report card, because you did ask for that. We did give you, I think, around January, a mid-year uh, report. And I'm sorry for the small print. You do have a copy of this. This is a nine-page document in the report, the report card section. And I'll hit on the highlights. And I will tell you up front, of the 10 top priorities, we did complete and or um, had significant progress on six of the 10. You go, keep going. Remember he's a teacher and now I'm just asking, is this a teacher you're in? You're in. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm doing? Is it, I get, as a teacher, I feel very disconnected. These are our county, top 10 goals, and yet you were sitting back here, and it's hard to engage you in this setting. So I want everybody to move their seat up all the way close to here, so the board, we can get your input, and so we can hear from you as a, as a organizational unit. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
facility. So we were directed to, directed to complete a comprehensive county-wide facilities master plan. We fell short on that, but you saw there was a lot of work done with Cosmod Associates as well as Cayman and Public Finance. So we made um, significant progress. Mr. Hay did update you on the various projects that are delineated in that top priority. So that falls under completed and in progress. And we're coming back on, it says here somewhere, we're coming back, what date, Neil? On September 25th with a more thorough update. We're okay with moving on to item four? Yes, sir. Thank you. Item four is with respect to the Sutter Point specific plan. So <clears throat> the direction was ensure compliance with Sutter Point specific plan and related environmental requirements when development commences. That falls under completed and in progress. We've actually done a lot. So the interesting thing about Sutter Point is we don't come in front of the board too often with Sutter Point items, but there's a lot of work taking place uh, behind the scenes. I mean, every week there's a lot. I mean, essentially, when you're building a new community that could hit upwards of 50,000 in population over a 30-year period, you don't just say, go do it. There's a lot of groundwork that takes years, actually decades. So this last year, this last fiscal year was a busy one. Uh, and we, we delineate some of the milestones that were achieved and more recently on June 12th, the board did approve hiring an, an outside consultant, Carol Shirley, who's got a ton of experience in the planning director of Sacramento City. She pretty much uh, did the coordinated and worked on the Potomac specific plan. So she bring, brings excellent direct experience to this issue because we're also part of the Potomac Basin Conservancy. So she's up. Uh, She's been a pleasure to work with, very helpful to Neil and his staff. Um, and we have regular meetings. We're now getting property owners and developers that are, are close to the pre-app process. Um, their frustration is we don't have turnkey um, parcels that they can just go build. <clears throat> but we definitely have the interest, especially on the, uh, the uh, industrial uh, warehouse the type of use and employ those large employers. We need um, large black parcels close to the airport. So lots of interest. We're, we're doing um, quite a bit of work. And now there's interest, too, to start with uh, residential subdivisions. So we're, we're working on that. Those are still two, three, four years away. But we've got to get the uh, infrastructure in line. And as you know, it's delineated in here. We're going to come back to the board uh, shortly uh, to um, start the process of soliciting proposals from firms to help us with the financing and uh, environmental infrastructure analysis because we we'll have to look at how we, um, we pay for all of this and the developers are fronting the bills at, at this point. The last paragraph delineates some of the, the challenges, whether it's the same gap issue, internal drainage, plaster parkway funding agreement, um, etc. So um, we just keep going on that. And we have regular meetings at the staff level. Any uh, questions on that? Okay, we'll move on. Item five, so this one falls under completed and it will move off of our top um, list of items. This uh, reads, conduct a thorough review of the county's existing marijuana cultivation ordinance and recommend potential revisions and provide a report to the board. So we've done that. Um, earlier in the year, the board was interested in going forward, exploring, doing a uh, tax measure of some sort going to the voters and the staff was um, working on that and, and then it was ultimately decided basically to, to wait and see because there were a series of issues that had been raised some of our surrounding uh, counties have, and cities have had some challenges with this so as that's the lineage here the recommendation is continue to wait and see see monitor what's going on and then if it makes sense to come back to this uh, we'll do so at board's direction so any other Clarification comments on that. Thank you. Priority number six. This reads, and yeah, we covered some of that today, starting with the current fiscal year, 2018-19, or the last year. Oh, this year. Um, prepare, yeah, for the budget that we have now, prepare a traditional operating and capital improvements program or CIP budget documents 
and the county's first comprehensive annual financial report, CAPR. Prepare a plan to achieve a structurally balanced budget. Provide semi annual reports to the board with respect to the county's pension and OPEP liabilities. And submit a proposal to prepare a long term financial strategic plan. In progress, we hit some of these targets, we're a little behind on others. I think what we did last year, we have these lofty uh, goals and priorities, but I'm glad we put them on the list. And uh, I would have liked to have added a thousand percent, but we ended up having 600. So we got six of the 10 we did complete. Um, but we're working on this, and we talked about some of this early, earlier. We're working with our um, auditor and controller to get a cap done for this year. Uh, a lot of hard work on that, and I appreciate everybody's indulgence and patience as we go through that. <clears throat> with respect to our budget, it's going to take us a while to get to a structurally balanced budget, but we know we, we have to get there. And we're coming to the board shortly. I think on September 25th, Matt Michaelis is leading the charge. He will come to the board with a um, request to um, do an RFP to get firms to uh, submit proposals to guide us into a long-term multi-year financial strategic plan. So that is that update. Does the board have any questions or comments on that? Moving on to priority number seven. This has to do with commercial truck parking issues, if I remember right, yes. Review the county's land use plan, suggest revisions for areas of Highway 99, south of the city boundaries, present a proposal for designated area or areas for a truck stop and related land use, and conduct an analysis to present options for improved code enforcement of businesses in the unincorporated areas. So I wish we could say completed, but we've made a lot of progress. Uh, there's been an increase in code enforcement, so we appreciate the board's decision to hire a code enforcement officer not that long ago. This person is inundated with work, as you can imagine, throughout the county. I wish we had the resources to have three or four code enforcement officers. We have the right person at the right time with the right personality doing that job. But she is outstanding. She's had a lot of success uh, with the commercial park uh, truck trucks operating on issues. We have a long ways to go. Uh, the, the board did back in, a year ago. We did establish an ad hoc committee with uh, two supervisors to review issues associated with commercial truck parking. You, that, that committee has met with the, uh, the trucking um, advocates and the residents. You know out in the community, you're hit all the time. I, I was at the gym this morning and a resident I, I don't know, is impacted significantly being living next to one of these facilities was going on and on about concern. So it, it, it's out there and it, it's not going away. But we made some good progress. And we're coming back to the board Neil, today we're coming back to the board. Yeah, yeah. October 9th. Uh, October 9th, there it is, I'm sorry. The committee's report for this recommendation and changes to the ordinance will come back on October 9th. This is a very tough issue. It's a, it's a, it involves a, a careful and delicate balancing act. The fees that have been collected are really um, beyond insignificant or below insignificant. Um, the Oswald um, intersection, which we need a lot, that's a $3 million project. I think we have collected at max $40,000. So we have to figure out a way how to pay for the impacts of this industry in the community without causing the industry to go away. So it's a complicated one. In progress, you'll get a more thorough update on October 9th. Any uh, questions or comments? Thank you. Let's move on to priority number eight. This has to do with flood protection, so I'll just read it. Continue to work with the Southern View Flood Control Agency, often referred to as Sabuka, State Department of Water Resources, and local levy and reclamation districts, other government agencies to complete ongoing countywide levy improvement projects and obtain funding for future levy projects. <clears throat> and work to obtain an improved flood protection insurance designation from the federal government for regions of the county with less than 100 year protection. Completed and in progress. We are blessed to have Sabuka the leadership there. They're an agency that gets things done. As you know, they spent over $300 million on levy improvements in the county. Really benefited the city. Your staff, uh, various supervisors and staff, have participated in a large number of meetings with Sabuka, DWR, Levy District 1, Levy District 9, and various other flood protection partners with respect to a variety of capital, uh, capital improvement projects. 
Uh, we still have a way, uh, ways to go. <coughs> but we've had successes with the uh, emergency project in protecting the downtown Yuba City area. Uh, that project's done. <coughs> Spoofka did uh, very good work uh, to obtain some uh, funding for the five mile stretch from Tudor Road to Cypress Road. And they uh, they followed up on the Laurel Road issue, the impact of that from the, the high water event and so on. And they, they worked uh, you know, with Neil and his staff, so we, we were able to take care of that issue uh, down there. <coughs> the, the challenge now is all the money that was provided to the federal and state governments to do these projects require ongoing maintenance. So levy districts one and nine are struggling with that issue have a series of meetings it will come in front of the board if they do uh, a vote they're going to have to do a vote and if, uh, so the board will have to agree to put that on the ballot and for these two levy districts to look at uh, you know, an increase in the yearly uh, property tax bill to cover the, the maintenance of, of these levies it's a difficult issue but at least it will go to the voters on the maintenance and the voters will have to decide if it's not funded then it's a big question mark we could lose our eligibility for the federal and state money, as I understand the issue. So we're working very closely with our partner on, on that. So we mark that as completed and in progress. Any questions? Comments? Thank you. Priority number nine, this has to do with communication with our, our residents and our businesses. We were directed to improve the county's website better use of social media to allow for more user-friendly interaction and to provide employee training with respect to customer service, civic engagement, etc., and to do a community survey. So completed and in progress. So we haven't done that community survey. We still have the, uh, the money for that and we'll, we'll visit that when we're ready. We have to take some baby steps before we jump in and we do that. We do have to continue the improvements to social media and up to the board fully aware when we had the Sutter Buttes uh, fire incident or the Buttes fire uh, incident, uh, we didn't do as good a job as we should have for you and how we communicated with the community and with, with each of you. We did a good job managing the fire and taking care of that, but we recognize we have a little ways to go. But that's good. This is good. Um, and we're in the pro process of purchasing a system to help get the word out. Right. So we've done, a, we've done a good job, but we need to do a better job. And we have participated in, uh, we, here's where we've excelled though, and Chuck has done a good job with this, in terms of participating and getting positive stories out there, the radio interviews, the, uh, each of you have penned uh, at least one or two uh, op-ed pieces articulating the services provided by the county and some of the issues that we do and we'll continue uh, to do that. Um, we have the annual state of the county address, and we're going to talk to the chair about expanding that and maybe doing a more traditional approach to that. We can talk more about that, that later. And we'll keep working on upgrading our website, more um, exposure on social media. And we've done a fair amount of customer service training with our employees, and we'll keep going. So we've done really, I, I feel we've done a really good job, but I was a little bit critical at the beginning. I think it's because of that fire incident and realizing we could have done a little bit better. Okay, so that is that one. Any questions or comments? Questions or comments? We're gonna have a class quiz after. Hand out candy. At tomorrow's E team we'll have a <laughs> All right, priority ten. This one is in progress and we're gonna move on from that one if the board so agrees. That's to resolve all outstanding Southern County Airport land use issues. I don't think we'll ever solve all those issues, but we have more clarity. We were able to identify for the board the actual uh, acreage, who owns what, what the, um, the history has been, and why and how did we get to where we are with the FAA. And we're striving to obtain land releases for a variety of properties that uh, the county has facilities on. And the only way to do that is you buy it at its appraised value or you pay rent payments. So we're going to kind of wait and see on, on, on this situation and um, just and move forward. Yeah, no further action is necessary at this time. All right. Okay. So on the last page, 
You just do the math of the 10 priorities. Six or 60% fall under completed or completed and in progress. And four, 40% were just in progress. I think the main point here is we didn't neglect any of these. We did our level best on them. Could we have done better? Yes. But that's the point of having priorities. Have lofty priorities. Aim high. Do the best you can with them. So if you were in college, you got 6% on your test. <laughs> 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 we ran on a curve. I was going to say that. Now in baseball, Mr. Whitaker, you got 600 percent during the whole thing. You know, we 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 could have structured this. I could have told you we were got 90 percent down, or you know, we could have structured it anyway. Um, the reality is, we made a lot of progress, and I'm proud of these men and women here for their leadership, and we've delivered on much of the stuff that's in front of you. Could we have done better? Sure. But remember, with management by objectives, we, this can't be the live all be all. You give us these top 10 things, you know, stuff happens, right? You've had a lot of drama as an organization. Stuff happens, you get distracted. You have fires, you have high water events, uh, you have unexpected um, retirements or whatever. But to be progressive and to be a high performance organization and to do better, you've got to have some objectives and standards and priorities. That's why we do this. We do this. And then you hold me accountable when you do my annual review, and I hold the department heads accountable as we do theirs through these um, priorities and goals. So that's the report card. So I guess the goal next year, we'll come back and be 65% or higher. Oh, I'll tell you right now, it's going to be a lot higher because <laughs> we're only doing top five priorities. Right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing top ten. No, no, by that, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to be up, right? 100%. That's the goal. Right? That's the goal. Yeah. And remember, these are these are your priorities. You have to be comfortable with. <laughs> so now we're going to shift and talk about the next fiscal year. Let me move on. Now. I would like to make a couple comments. I'd like to sure. say first, thanks for that report. Um, you know, percentage wise, always room for improvement, of course. But uh, I, I do want to commend all the people here for your involvement getting these goals and priorities kind of together, especially over the last year and over the last several years that you've worked here. And I just, you know, we couldn't do it without the employees and you guys. You guys are the ones who make it happen. And I just want to take a moment, you know, we don't do that enough and uh, we need to do that. I really want to recognize the hard work that you do and thank you for taking the direction and, and moving things forward and making things work out because you're, you're the ones who have to make it happen every day. You know, we sit up here work with you on the goals, but you're the ones who make it happen. So I just want to say thank you for that. Maybe the board, we can give a round of applause for working on it. And it's so weird being so close to you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to reach out and give them a hug. No hug calls. Okay. Anyway, I just want to take that moment. I really appreciate the work you do. This, I mean, this, there's always the drama and the things going on in the county. We hear all the different things, but at the end of the day, you're driving towards those goals and making it work. And things are, are really happening in, in a very positive direction. It's, it's great to see. So that's, that's my day. Wow, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Can we leave now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we gave you the report card. That was the focus on staff. So now we're going to shift it back to focus on the board. So the five of you were asked to submit what your top priority, excuse me, priority would be for the currently this year that just started. And it, there was a variety of them. So this document, which is hard to read on the screen there, but what's in front of you, I, I tried to list literally everything you had stated. So when you see there's seven of them, and then what happened is these seven fell in seven categories, from leadership, budget finance, facilities, homelessness, Set of points, set of engagement, general plan. So I, I try to put it out there and make sure we have included everything that you listed. So under, I'll start with. The, I'll go from top to bottom, and these reflect uh, by number of votes, if you will. So leadership, all five of you had listed specific things that deal with leadership, and vision, from setting efficiency goals in terms of staffing levels, to the use of dashboards to include expectations and outcomes. Succession planning, filling vacant uh, department head positions, creating a vision for the county, develop an organizational strategic plan, develop a mission statement, improve the relationship with the city, develop a cohesive executive team and cooperation between the 
departments, that all, generally speaking, falls under the leadership category. The next category, number two, is uh, budget slash finance, and listed things such as achieve a strategically balanced budget, develop a long-term financial strategic plan, plan, including approach to managing long-term pension and health insurance obligations, financial stability, unfunded pension liability, find a solution to unfunded liability, cut the budget by 5%, no cuts to health, welfare, fire, and sheriff, reduce the overall, excuse me, overall budget by 5 to 10%, Return to the five-day work week for office hours. Uh, in other words, eliminate the 980 program and 410 program. Increase public safety salaries. Keep Southern County fiscally sound. Develop a comprehensive plan to increase general fund reserves. Southern County negotiations. Privatize services where possible. Work with Yuba City on improving the master tax exchange agreement. Set up a joint revenue measure for city slash county in 2020 and set up a centralized finance department. So there's a lot there. But all five of you weighed in on those issues. And we felt that would fall under budget finance. The third uh, item is facilities. So four of the five of you listed priorities dealing with facilities ranging from complete the countywide facilities master plan, consolidate the city departments into fewer locations, get 850 Gray Avenue up and running, Remove square footage to add new square footage. I like that. Um, get rid of old buildings that cost too much. And there are some other comments. Next category, uh, number four, three of you commented specifically on, on homelessness. Did you want to make any comments on any of the above ones? No. Okay. So homelessness, uh, here's some of the comments you had. Implement long-term homeless management plan. No general fund impacts. Reduce the number of homeless and continue to develop long-term solutions. The fifth category, which received two comments, uh, involved Sutter Point specific plans. One of you wrote, begin construction. Another, move forward on Sutter Point, commercial and industrial development at the same time as residential. In items six and seven, um, one dealt with civic engagement, continue to remind voters why they need to know their supervisor and county interest, one dealing with general plan update in the process. So then the question is, all right, how do you go from there? Well, I think there's any comments. There's okay. any comments regarding that portion. And for me, I think it's important that people know exactly what, what my top five were. Because I think for the organization, for me, it's important that uh, when we are looking at the organization as a whole, that we take care of the needs of the organization first, and then we go with the, the outside interests of the public. Um, so I will tell you my top five, top five priorities. <coughs> For me, it was my first top five, my first priority was uh, Southern County Employee Negotiations. Uh, we don't take care of our employees, right? And Supervisor um, Munger can attest to this as well. And we lose employees to other counties. We will lose, we will become a training ground for other counties. And that's something I just don't want to do. I don't want to go back to the days of uh, the sheriff coming in and saying, you can't fill 12 deputy sheriff positions because uh, you know our salaries and our benefits are not comparable to what other counties you'll ever see. So it's important that we take care of our employees and our units and, and making sure that they are fairly compensated and that we can attain quality employees. So that was my first uh, top line priority. My second one is to obviously develop an organizational strategic plan, emphasis on mission statement. Discuss that enough. I don't think there's any other further discussion. The third was to uh, work to develop a comprehensive plan to increase the Southern County General Fund Reserves. And obviously, uh, you folks know that uh, you know, healthy reserves and, and a healthy budget means that we offer, uh, you know, we're able to offer uh, different programs. And so, but right now, it always really seems like we're status quo. Uh, and we have to uh, be able to find ways, innovative ways, and what those are, we can put from you and uh, find ways that we can grow as a county and increase those, those uh, general fund reserves. 
that we have money in our coffers uh, to do certain programs and, and go outside and, and create innovative projects and do things in this community. Uh, number four is a uh, complete consolidation of uh, health and human services and uh, the gray outbreak facility. I mean, Neil uh, pretty much touched on this as, as much as that uh, you know, we have to uh, consolidate uh, different uh, um, departments and, and look Obviously, that rehabbing facility will accommodate a big portion of that. That has got to be a part of the first time to get that with that. And, and then work on other uh, avenues of consolidating different funds as well. My fifth is uh, just to work with the city of Yuba City on improving the master capturing agreement. I think that you know, the city of Yuba City is receptive to doing this stuff, but I think that we have to sit down at the table with the counterparts and uh, uh, work on uh, work together and take those uh, future annotations to make sure that uh, we are at the table and uh, that we are supported not only the city, but uh, uh, the county and the city of working day to make that happen. That was my top five priorities. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor. Appreciate that. Uh, any further comments? Board side? All right. Okay, so then the question is, how do you go from that to having a set of top priorities? I also did ask the uh, department heads to submit what they would consider to be their top priorities without seeing anything on the board. And um, fairly in line. They, they, they had some other uh, suggestions that were really, really dynamite. So what I, what I did is, okay, the board's made it clear with these first five, these are your priority areas. So we're gonna have five, leadership, budget finance, facilities, homelessness, and center point. So you go to the next page, Okay, yeah. oh, no. So right here, this is what we're recommending for a starting point for your discussion. Control the lights. So under leadership, here's the suggested language. Complete long-term organization, strategic plan for the organization. Complete employee succession plan, strengthen executive team, improve employee morale, and develop formal performance benchmarks dashboard metrics. At this point, I'd ask the board, what, what do you think of that? Should we um, do you want to go through all these and come back, or do you want to? Sure. Do yeah, I think it's better if you. Okay, then you get the bigger picture and decide yeah. which one you Fair enough, thank you. So under budget finance, it would read as follows. Select consultant to prepare long-term financial strategic plan. You know what? Why don't I strike select consultant? Because that's good. Done. We can just say prepare. Prepare long-term financial strategic plan, including a plan to achieve a structurally balanced general fund budget. Prepare GFOA and CSMFO award-winning fiscal year 1920 countywide operating and capital improvement plan budget documents. Complete review and convert. Not convert and convert to a, a biennial two-year budget process. Prepare a comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year 1819, and provide semi-annual pension and OPEB liabilities reports. Three, under facilities, let's take out higher consulting and just simply start with complete countywide facilities master plan Resolve ownership issue and complete architectural design at 850 Gray Avenue. Complete jail expansion project and work with other U.S. federal local governments to develop a proposal to consolidate public safety dispatch. On that one, several of you keep mentioning the dispatch issue, so I want to be respectful to that and not um, neglect that unless you direct us to. And there's mixed, uh, as we said in you know, the report card, some agencies are supportive of this, some aren't. So there's a mixed review on that, or mixed bag out there, but we recommend that you wait until the new sheriff, or both the two new sheriffs come on board in January and then see what their interest is and, and uh, go forward from there if there is an interest to do that. Okay, then moving forward from that, number four, homelessness. Implement long-term homeless management plan. Decide location, configuration, and initial services associated with a temporary shelter facility and work with other Yuba City, or sorry, Yuba Southern agencies to develop a permanent long-term shelter. Fifth, the Southern Point specific plan item, 
continue to work with property owners and developers to process res residential, industrial, and commercial development applications. Hire an outside counsel, so you know, or so let's write that and just simply write, prepare comprehensive financial, environmental, and public infrastructure analysis to ensure quality development takes place and work with applicable outside agencies as part of the due diligence process. I did take out the reference to consultants. It's not necessary. We just have to do that task and how we get there, whether it's in-house or consultants. We'll deal with that. Okay. So what do you think and how do you want to make revisions? Just keep them on you team? No. Um, what I did is I, several of these department heads provided their list and then I incorporated their suggestions in with yours, but we're not overriding. These are your priorities. Does the input for both? Mm -hmm. Yes. For sure. No, I was just saying that uh, how come uh, you didn't put the numbers behind each one of uh, the staff proposed ones? Well, they're your priorities. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The, these are our priorities or these are D-team's priorities? Well, these are the board's priorities. The D-team have input on giving the priorities. They did. This is it? No, I, what we did is we took the priorities that came from the board and then I incorporated the applicable ones from the E team that tied into the ones that you said are your, your priorities. They had other things that I'm out there that are not part of this. So. Yeah, and yeah, that's why we're separate. And it's the board's prerogative how you want to get to your um, priorities. I understand that this is, these are the, the, the top five for the board's priorities. As an organization, though, I would just like to see and have a total buy-in. I'd like to see what the team is Okay. Um, are, are those in here? Oh, yeah, they're, they're different. Uh, they're incorporated, but they're not. It's not 100 percent. Okay, you don't have to do it right now. I right. Just said, said it at, at a certain time. Though. Right. Yeah. I, I can share with you. What I can do is a separate follow-up. Yes. I can have a list. You can see them all. Yeah. 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 And we don't have to have a separate meeting for just. Send it to it. Uh, Absolutely. Board the table. Uh, give the e teams priorities. I'll do that. <clears throat> you said most they're pretty much in alignment, but it would be. Yeah, there. Um, for example, I uh, not to pick on anybody, but anybody, but your um, your museum director and library director had some suggestions that aren't on here, um, but they're very good. That may involve sort of uh, their stuff. But what I could do is, I think it'd be excellent. So you can see, I'll, I'll just delineate them all without saying who did what, and then you'll, you'll see that. Yeah. And I, I, if I can inter interject on that, just because items don't work their way on here, mm -hmm. there's still priority for us to implement. Yeah, but I, th I think it's a good, uh, very good suggestion for us, Brother Whitaker. That way we can also see uh, the priorities from the E-team and what they're looking at all together. So yeah, we incorporate a lot of them, but it'd be always good for us to see the whole list. I'm happy to do that. And, okay. um, Happy to do that. Comments, yeah. uh, comments, any suggestions, comments? Yeah. I think incorporating it, it gets to what our uh, department heads are thinking. If they're in the same line, if there's something that we're missing, I'd like to see if we're missing something. But I ain't seen it all. If it's, it's, uh, we're doing it, we might as well do it and make sure we incorporate it all. Yeah. Okay. Do <coughs> you have a soldier? Any comments? I, no, I just agree with that. Yeah. You know, many hands make like work, as they say, but uh, again, the more input we can get on some of these difficult management decisions, involved, especially in, in the world of finance, as I'm sure uh, Mr. Mitnick will tell you, uh, it, it's nice to have goals and, and say we, we want to do this. The financial constraints uh, perhaps limit that, so it's, it's good so that everyone understands it's not always talking from a real black checkbook. The sure the checkbook is uh, borderline red. Okay. I, I'd like to, um, I think it's safe to say, because you have to come up with your top five, top 10, or whatever the number is, what the department heads have suggested, they are incorporated in this. Okay. Um, remember, we're, we're very limited in the number and space. So if we were to grow this list, we'd be back to having 10 or more. 
I think what you, I know what you have in front of you reflects the very top priorities of the organization. Um, and then when we come back for adoption of that formally, we have to have a list of what the department has came up with. So you can see that at the same time. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, it, it, even though it does make a list, it doesn't mean it's, a, it's not a priority right. for the organization. Yeah. And just like you gave the example of the library and the museum, uh, you know, I want to make sure that those, as, as a board, that we get to see those. Right. Because, uh, you know, when, when we're looking at different things that uh, are funding, and those come up, it's like, hey, wait, this was a priority uh, you know, back in the last one or two years ago. Right. And we can fund these things. So. Right. Like, for example, some of them are make better use of technology. Um, you know, a lot of these roll right in, actually. They, 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 a lot of them really roll in. But I want to be fair to the men and women here. I'm not going to say 100% what they recommended is in there, but they're very close. I think one of uh, Jessica's was to incorporate um, what other uh, departments are doing as it relates to museum, library, and life as far as promoting quality of life issues. Obviously, those are important. Very important. So I think we can achieve both the objectives when we do our report back to you. You'll see you know, all the okay. response. So um, I have a couple of comments there. First of all, that's pretty good being able to move those over because I, I was looking at this list at first and seven, thinking, oh my gosh, how do you get all of those into one, you know, into five priorities? But I, I think that's a good method to take, you know, five major categories and then place subcategories under and I think they're more achievable than saying hey here's a specific right. priority that's really hard to tackle um, my question is more on execution because I want to come back and get a hundred percent I don't want to come back and get the sixty percent right now so so yes so, right yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know we want to come back with a high grade next year and one suggestion I have is and this comes from working with another board that you might be familiar but I sit on the Sutter Health Board which has 75,000 employees and uh, you know ma massive amounts of assets and things. But one of the things they do very effectively is that they have their sets of goals and priorities in place, and they have a um, a executive committee. So like when you took number one, the leadership, and under the executive committee is typically made up of the CAO, um, in our case possibly legal counsel, or a couple of supervisors. It could be anybody. Uh, and then um, maybe a couple of other leader, leaders on the executive team that would help assure that we uh, proceed, especially with that category. You know, a lot of these things, if you look at them, they were carry on from, these were some of the ones that weren't completed, like dashboard objectives and things like that. So if we had an executive committee, I don't know if the, the board would be interested in having something like that, but I, I think it would be really helpful in making sure that we're proceeding so that we don't show up next year and say, Hey, we missed out on that. Instead, we're proceeding together, um, and we can see that. And the other is in the area of uh, the budget and finance. Um, and I know we've talked about this in the past too, in, in the consideration of actually setting up a, a budget finance committee. So again, this would be a couple of members of the board and then um, financial leaders, you know, financial officers from the county, who would then meet and go over because you have some very tough priorities coming with the CAFR. The budget issues, the you know the employees, um, you know, all of this stuff that could be incorporated within the budget and finance, but having it without some sort of committee oversight, um, the opportunity to actually accomplish this is going to be really challenging without bringing it back to say, hey, this committee is going to be responsible to make sure that these things, these objectives are met. So I don't know, I don't know how the board feels about it, but. You know, those two, I know we have a lot of committees already, but these are like really critical to the operations of any organization or business. And again, I'm just using my own experience with a much larger organization, but it's very, very effective in terms of getting uh, communication through and meeting objectives because you can set those objectives for everything. But those are just a couple of suggestions. But I like the way you wrapped it into this thing. Would you like to? From a staff perspective, that'd be great because it would be a good sounding board for us. Make sure we're going right. So I could uh, incorporate that in at the end of both of those. Uh, establish and um, again using an executive committee and a budget finance committee, or work with a the clerk's office to set that up the correct way. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I think we'll really help with the uh, execution and implementation of a lot of these things. So we're not coming back later. Maybe we can get this done. So. Okay.
clear. I would, uh, I guess, humbly request that you consider trying to strike and reduce some of the items because I'll say for five priorities, this probably seems close to about 30 action items. And I'll say, at least speaking for myself, maybe for some of the other department heads, I think that probably the department heads, we probably spend about 75% of our time probably maybe just being department heads and running our departments and taking care of the normal course of the business. And I look at all these things as extras. And I'll, I'll say, personally, for my departments, I don't have 25% time available to accomplish the items that would be on my list. Um, I'd really like to see you take some consideration when you strike some of those things. I think also some of the things I think you're aware of is that uh, some of the items up there regarding facilities and homelessness, as you're probably fully aware, are going to take uh, and require uh, a fairly serious financial investment fairly soon. And if the investment's not made, we won't make June the 30th of next year. So I guess I would, you know, I just want you to be aware of that. that um, can, you, uh, can you make a suggestion, let's say on item number three, would you would strike? I'd say uh, resolving the ownership issue, straight 50 gray is unlikely. The architectural design will probably get Speed, but you know you have to understand like the cost of that contract is going to cost three to five hundred thousand dollars for the architect, mm -hmm. and that'll come to you on in September twenty fifth, and that's why that would be so you know, general fund. But so potentially it could be stricken at that point, right? It, it could be, yeah. Okay. I guess it's a matter of either there's always a, an ongoing list that can be evaluated and considered, but uh, the jail expansion project is going to complete. But as you know, there are going to be some sizable change orders coming before your board in the next month. Uh, that's going to require general fund dollars. Okay. And, and I guess, you know, there's, and unfortunately, there's uh, things associated with facilities, homelessness, uh, will, will be considerable. The uh, items related to the Sutter's Point specific plan, certainly we're going to be able to hire consultants and I guess a large percentage of that can be you know, reimbursed by the developers. But I guess one of my challenges is that the priorities are very general and broad and not specific. And I think when they're not specific, it makes it very hard to deem whether or not you have completed the action. So, so if we could just refer back to item number three again, can you tell me what could be more specific? Why don't we just make it more specific about uh, just yeah, and do it take 850 Great Avenue and take your jail expansion? If I can interject, uh, just for clarity, it's a good yeah. question. Yeah, it is. Neil's part. Yeah, thank you. Um, remember, we'll take Sutter Point. Because that item is here and it talks about continuing to work, it doesn't mean we build all the homes out there, but we're looking at what are we going to do in this one year time frame to help move this project forward. So it's we're going to complete what we're supposed to do over one year. And the same for these other projects with respect to the facilities. We will complete a facilities master plan. We will get that done during the year. The ownership issue, we are working on that. Are we going to purchase that property or are we going to stay with the lease? I'm very fairly confident we'll resolve that in the next 12 months. So, but, but Neil doesn't feel the same confidence. So, so instead of resolving, I mean, maybe we continue to work on the ownership process? Neil? I guess it's a matter of you know, the wording that you feel appropriate because I mean, if you're looking for a higher sense of Completion by say June 30th of next year. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be more helpful to have more finite words that with more finite tasks. Uh, the, the complete the architectural design at 850 gray. Yes. The, I, mean, I guess realize that that there are there's about four opportunities at 850 gray as to what the final you know what the right. design yeah, looks like. I know you're talking. And those we. So I think that would be a complete the jail expansion project. The other items. I guess I would say are are some of the things that are going to happen anyway and in support. And a lot of these actions are tied to each other that they have had an impact on, on if other parts of the project or other items on the list can be seen. And, and that timing of all those things is somewhat critical. The 
Should we, I mean, I'm okay if you want to go down the list one by one. I mean, that's fine with me. So if you want to start with number three again and say, so hire a consultant, can we get that done in the next year? Yes, yeah, so hire a consultant for the countywide facility management plan. Okay, great. And then resolve ownership issues. We're saying no. Just complete the architectural design and make 50 gray. Okay, are you guys getting yeah. striking resolving ownership issues as a priority on this list? I'm sure the CEO will. Okay, we're going to or, in there. We're going to deliver that anyhow. Yeah. For work to resolve? No, just take it off, right? Just, just take it off. Complete design. architectural design. Okay, then uh, complete architectural design. Okay, good. And then a complete jail expansion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Okay, so that's three. And then uh, work with governments to develop a proposal to consolidate public safety dispatch. I have to delete it. Delete it? You guys are It's a process to come up. That's just not just not sure. And let me tell you why it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because, uh, you know, other board members with, uh, with the former sheriff, and he told me uh, a long time ago, he says they've tried to do it before and uh, it didn't work. Uh, everybody wants to, you have to understand that when you consolidate, you lose staff. Okay? And so, uh, Nobody wants to lose. Nobody wants to lose staff. Plus, the fact of the matter is, is that our our system is not compatible with other counties or cities' uh, uh, systems. So they would have to go and change everybody's system so they would have one compatible. Fair enough. Well, so I, I think the, the board's okay with striking that as a as a major goal. Yeah. 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 It's not going to get solved. Clear, clear. Comment. Well, I didn't know if we can continue to go through these if you'd like. In a way, that's what part of this uh, meeting is for. Or uh, for the sake of time, we can take this list to the E team and come back with some recommendations as well. I mean, either way, I just thought. Well, I think I'd, I'd like to finish the line on because it's short. It's not very long. Yeah. And, and then this way we can leave. Because I don't want anyone to go away, especially this group, with the sense of like these guys are not telling them we're going to have all this stuff we have to do, you know, and then wanting it 100% done, uh, and then come back and say well, it's not going to happen. So, I mean, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather let's say, hey, let's let's achieve the goal, and then we meet some achievable. Goals. Someone set the bar too high. We were 60% right. Now. <laughs> can, I mean, we need to set the bar a little higher we, than normal. How many yeah. questions, the chair? Just because we put it on here as a goal doesn't mean some of these goals may be years year object many years of objectives yes it may right. not be one year maybe we should be strive to work for yes or something like that we could put on there not not to uh, accomplish like like these 50 grand you may not have that done for three years right and that's why it's just the architectural design component mm -hmm. but yeah. i mean actually the, if you decide you want to try to look at long-term ownership well, I think Scott addressed that early on when I said you know, there's hundreds of priorities. Right. We're just deciding right now sort of what direction we want to go for the next 12 months. But if you don't set that as an objective for the long haul, how are you ever going to get there? Well, we'll get there. Well, it's there. Wait, it's other messages. It's going away just because Neil doesn't want it on yeah. this right. list. It's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we do it through the budget process, through the program descriptions and the CIP. We list all kinds of projects. I mean, these are your top ones that we're going to focus on. So let me read what I think I heard. A temporary employee may be reading what's happening. Yes. Well, I, I just wanted to echo what Neil was saying, and I think one of the things that you might add to that facilities portion is establish a financial commitment to those specific projects. Because we can work towards a project and we come to you with a $30 million project, you say there is no way we can do that. So I think that we have to establish that financial commitment to those projects Good. as part of that it's fine, yeah. facilities one. And that will come with the facilities master plan. Right. And that will be articulated. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what you guys did with that. So how about I read what will be the revised facilities item number three? Yeah. Shorter. Complete countywide mass, excuse me, complete countywide facilities master plan. Complete architectural design of 850 Gray Avenue, complete jail expansion project. That's it. There you go. Okay, very good. Sure. Um, in order to make sure that we get 100%, we'll have no control on item number two, but uh, 
car, uh, GSOA, CSF, and both countywide operating uh, plans are a more than can we have the word possible? Well, the goal is to get it to, if you don't mind. I know we want it to be awesome, yeah. but you know, if it's awesome and it doesn't win, we're not going to get it 100%. <laughs> I know, but um, what I would say this, look, from a management, motivational standpoint, we, we need to have targets. What, just from a procedural standpoint, these were the five top priorities. Did the board agree and, and say, yes, we adopt these, and we're giving you direction, and now we're going through them? I, I'm not yeah, sure. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, got it. That's what so you want to go through the process first, and then make that Right, yeah. Okay. So what we have done so far, each of us wrote our own five priorities and then and then they were incorporated within this document. It looks like all of them are incorporated but right. just under five categories instead. So okay. yeah. and it's uh, what, it's we, we haven't adopted out. this. Okay. So I mean it is good even after this that if you do take it back to the E team and there is further input or editing then yeah. we're willing to look at that a staff proposal to adopt it, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, anything on the homelessness side? Of it? You know, I just want to direct because I know a lot of this is falling right under your purview. So, okay. I think the design, location, and configuration, and mission services uh, for the temporary shelter, I think, is a, is a great idea, and I think we can should be able to get there. But I would think quite. Okay. I don't think it's going to happen all this year. Um, I would also tell you why we need to start happening. <laughs> uh, and, and I guess that's the thing. I think uh, maybe my point is that I think some things maybe there's not enough of a push to make happen. Is that I think if we get to where we like respectfully, if we bring you know the best alternative to you, right. then I guess it's a matter of either this is the best alternative and this is our opportunity to meet the goal and the priority, or then that then that's it. But I, but what I will tell you that this does take staff a lot of time is that when we bring something forward, I'll say not only all this, but a number of other issues, and then it's kind of like, well, let's go and retry something else and, you know, kind of, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll say it. either we need to have better dialogue going forward so that we bring them to you either more of what you're looking for or, or one time because like I say the uh, the time one one the amount of time to bring something to you and then two the time to regroup and then uh, uh, if only government would work that way that'd be so amazing <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine what they say at the federal and state levels <laughs> but I think you know maybe we're going to have a discussion on our norms mm -hmm. and possibly one of those things going forward, because I, I kind of hear what you're saying, but a lot of it is uh, you know, a lot of transparency and discussion during the process, rather than coming back at the end going, here's a document, by the way, it's gonna cost you an extra two million because we've got for the air conditioner in the jail, right? right. So, I mean, those kind of surprises are like shocking to, uh, to the board of supervisors. You have to like figure out, you know, eventually who's gonna get cut and not uh, from the budgets makes it really challenging. So to eliminate, to your point, you know, working to, to eliminate surprises through transparent discussions and possibly through the use of that um, finance executive committee you know, format may be helpful. But I think, you know, I think to, to say, okay, we're gonna end the politics of the situation, that would just be amazing, but you know, I don't think that will ever occur. But we'll work towards it, right, and make a commitment. Good. Is there anything else on that on that number? Okay, what about number five? No, I guess I would actually. Can anybody throw, else do? If you think I would actually throw in a comment about number one as far as improving mor employee morale. I thought maybe it might be more helpful maybe to identify the employee morale. I mean, I I would say personally, I think I have great morale in my department. <laughs> okay. you know, I mean, my, I, and and I guess there's a, always some sense that not everyone is always going to be happy about their situation. So. I guess it's whether it's a perceived notion that employee morale is not where it needs to be, but I think if we were to take just to do it correctly, if we spent some time just trying to identify where we think the morale is, you know, relative to either other agencies, other business sectors. Just a 
Yeah. So uh, was that one of yours? Or? Uh, no, but uh, Neil, perhaps you could go to the district attorney's office and help them down there a little bit. Okay. <laughs> we did, we did. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chair, we did have some department heads with their employee morale support. Oh, that came from the department. Yes, yeah, that one. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, we we'll didn't take it, but you know, I, the, those are always tough ones for me because I can't put a measurable, like, what's the measurable result on it? And it's like, how do you know? You know, everyone says good morning and they're all happy, you know, it's like, but how do you really know? Can I say something on that note? And yes. this might seem counterintuitive because I think I am maybe the smallest department in the county. You know, the public defender. How's your morale? <laughs> Talking to yourself. Yeah. Um, no, there is, I, I just wanted to say something about that because since I don't have finance staff, I don't have an administrator, I don't have an assistant, there's two of us that work full time in the museum. And so for me, when I'm working with other departments often, I'm not only working with the other department heads, I'm working with people at all different levels. And um, I'm not going to mention any department or any employee by name, but I can tell you a lot of people I talk to, they see well, like that employee brought up in the Board of Supervisors meeting the other day, they see renovations on buildings and they see gift loans for department heads and they don't see anything happening at their level and it is very frustrating for them. They do hear you guys say often that employees are very important and that you want to do more for them, but they don't see it. So I just wanted to share that from my point of view sure. because I think I do have a different insight than a lot of other department heads because of my lack of levels in my own department. Get to meet a lot of other employees on all different levels. Okay, so then it sounds like improve employee morale. We need to leave in there, but define better. And I would say again, that there's an opportunity to do that through the leadership, through the executive committee, through your meetings to say, hey, you know, here's here's the perception, right? So I mean, we don't, we can't, we understand the perception until we realize what it is, and then we're told what it is, right? And so right now, you just brought up something. Else. Myself. I never even thought about that, right? So it's exactly how we have to, first we have to identify those issues, then it goes through the CAO's office, to, through, through this process where we can look at it and say, okay, we do want to leave it in here as a goal because it is an issue that's affecting you, and now we have to define how it's affecting you, and then we got to say, okay, how can we get back to addressing the issue to make sure that that doesn't occur or that we minimize the occurrence of that, so the morale does stay high, right? Yes, sir. And I'll also say, as you as department heads and elected officials, you, you know your departments pretty well. You know you know your you know the employees very well. You know when uh, they are uh, having issues at home. You know when they're having uh, certain situations that you know we don't see obviously because you know we're not the micromanaging uh, board supervisor. We are allow you to manage your, your own department. And so you know in that regard, I think that morale in this county. In a certain parts might be a little bit low. Uh, I will not say that the district attorney's office is low. I would say that you know the district uh, attorney's office actually has pretty good morale. Uh, and in general, I think all departments have pretty good morale in this county. Uh, but like I said, there, there might be some uh, you know other departments that we need to strengthen. And so I think that's why we're leaving. Okay. Yeah. Answer your question. Is that helpful to do that with? We need to show love or love and appreciation. We get it. So we, we get it. But it's all about how we understand what's going on. Thanks. Mr. Chair, members yeah. of the board, and as we do the employee succession plan and the organizational and strategic plan for, for HR purposes, that will touch on employee morale. That, that's a big component of that. Okay. You know, how can we be a more compassionate and you know, successful agency? Yeah, this is a really good feedback. Very helpful. Yeah. So I, I think uh, we kind of narrowed it down, Neil. Any other, anything any else for other departments? I can feel the other comment I'll make because is that yeah. as far as budget and finance, is that certainly you have appointed uh, department heads that are here, but some of are involved elected our partner heads and, and they're not present. And a lot of this is going to be critical of them to perform their role in order to achieve some of the goals. That's a good point. Yeah, I think, I think um, and to address part of that, part of the idea behind a budget finance committee to sort of bring people together to this this goal, so there's a continuous discussion. But very good points. Thanks for your points. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. okay. So we will come back.
Well, we're not done with the whole thing, but we will come back to the board with the recommendations. Priorities, I suggest. Okay, so now I hand it over to Mr. Lopez. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Before we get on that thing, um, back on the, uh, you know, your county wide goals, maintaining a strong commitment to public safety. As the president of the Southern County Professional Firefighters Association, um, we are going to be in some serious issues in, 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 the, near, in, the, in the upcoming budgets. And I'd like to see something, you know, publicly talked about as far as the long term financing. Or, or uh, funding for it. I mean, uh, two of our three stations are staffed with one on duty. Um, two thirds of our first out of equipment is out of service permanently. The one that's left is 28 years old. Two of our four wildland engines are 28, 40 years old. Um, we are going after a grant for staffing for the firefighters' position. Then after January 1st, it's going to be a dollar 12 in the minimum wage. But we have some huge problems. I appreciate Mr. Whitaker talking about. Uh, working on some funding to increase the, the salary so we're not a training. I've lost over a third of my department from neighboring departments. We're, we're spending thousands of dollars training them, getting them up to rank to probation, and they're gone. They're not only leaving for large salary increases, but they're leaving for staffing and brand new fire apparatus. Um, our trucks are, are older than some of the drivers that are driving them. And that's a, you know, I, I believe that our employees deserve better and are citizens demand so I'd like to see that be brought up as a priority can we start thinking about that to the chair yes so tell me when was the last time uh, the uh, fire service had a definitive assessment uh, the original was passed in I believe 1990 the second was passed in 1996 it's a flat tax with no inflation. So, so obviously since 1996 we have not had an increase in the definitive assessment correct so don't you think it, it, it behooves us in this time maybe to go back out to the public and say, hey, you know, uh, these men and women who, you know, come out and, and provide us excellent service for the county, uh, it might be time for the county to get behind uh, and have you do a benefit center. Now, obviously, I, I would talk to the uh, Chief Shalvis before we do anything, because I think you've been actually involved in this. Yeah, we've had some, some great discussions. Uh, I think that our woes are sooner than that could, you know, be funded even if in a perfect world. Um, I mean, for example, the, the fire truck that's sitting at Live Oak right now was purchased for around 240000 That fire truck's getting replaced by the city of Live Oak this year at 549000 with no budget change. So, yeah, it, things have went up and the dollars the same dollar. So, I definitely hear you. I definitely hear you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your input. Could, 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 yes. Yeah, it's going to take full effort between all those departments to go back out because we're flat. There has not been an escalator on that particular path. So everything's gone up trucks, gas, fuel, insurance. And I think uh, by putting out a good campaign out there, I don't think we're going to have a problem. The, we've lost some great employees. The a lot is going to have to be done. We're going to have to get somebody to do a study of what it costs now for your insurance and how much may you're paying more because you don't have the employees to what we would have to do staff over the three. Sure yes, sir. I couldn't agree more. We've got to raise that competitive assessment to help you out in the future. A fire truck in 1990 cost probably $150,000 out of the And, you know, an employee played the same thing. Everything's going up, but that's the same thing. can't call that. The whole call for service has changed in my career immensely. Um, yeah, we're busier than we ever have, a little more, a little less equipment, less staffing. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, we have to do something. Right? And, and more medical aid calls now than you yeah, had in the Even more non emergency calls, not even right. the ones that are actually life threatening. It's just a call. <laughs> Socially, they're demanding more services. And I think that's not just, you know, our share. I think that's across the board for every department. Yeah. I think that's just something that's changed. So, yes, I mean, it's, uh, we've, uh, we've done a great job of, of doing the best at the same dollar for a long, long time. I mean, I commend our previous chiefs and our, 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 our boards for, you know, we've done a great job. It's just, it's not working anymore. I also think that if you would allow the public to know what they could save on their insurance by getting a higher rating, I think they'd be more to fund it too. 
Correct. Yeah, because our ISO ratings that you have have went from some of the departments have lost members right. that increases their transport. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thanks for your input. Any further discussion on that? Okay. Sure. And, and you want to oh, just uh, the issue of how you find the fire department will be covered from time to time. Do the committee as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So now we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Lopez to talk about the board norms. Well, first off, I want to just acknowledge how big a step it was last year for the Board of Supervisors to decide that they wanted a not only a set of norms, but we had discussion and then we began to talk about how you were going to operate with these uh, norms. Can you see them all? Yes. Okay. So the, the key piece, though, is to recognize that what norms do, obviously in a very potential contentious political environment, is they offer a way to set the tone. And that's important from a leadership perspective when you think about how can you set the tone and hopefully uh, that continues to build not only within the county, but outside. And so what I'd like to do in looking at these is first ask you, how do you think you did? I don't want to say it's a report card, but yeah. how, it's a report card. <laughs> so if you were to give yourself a grade, thank you, Jeff, that was a good idea. How, how do you, what grade would you give yourselves in terms of following these five norms during the course of the year? As a group? <laughs> That's a moment of truth right there. That's a moment of truth. Well, let's start off collectively. Comments? I think we can agree on all five of them. I didn't say we've done terrible, but we can agree. I think we've done better. I've seen worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to remove any 
or do you want to add in? So first, do you want to keep norms, as you, these norms, as you go on uh, to the next year? I would say yes. I mean, it, it, they seem to be working. So, you know, and, and if I said, it's good to uh, go back and, uh, and make sure that we have all of these things. And if we're not, then at least uh, we say, hey, we voted on it. Uh, making sure that we respect all of them that we are professional. I think we should keep them. Uh, this gives a framework for people to come in in my position. That down the road, you can step in the hole and make them, you know, see this is the way we operate. And, you know, now I'm on your own, but you do cooperate with each other. You do have disagreements, but you still can go out and maybe have a drink down. So I'm, I'm hearing, for the most part, that the group wants to continue the norms? Yeah. Okay. I'll get wrong. Do you want to take any one of these off? Or you're happy with all five? Okay. Do you want to add any norms to this? Any new norms? So is there anything missing that you think about? Relate to one another. Okay, one's in public, one's in public. 
Yeah. So the word yeah. staff is removed? Yes. As I understand it, is that correct? No, you can put a period right there. Uh, refrain from You can get up on us in public and that's fair. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but speaking negatively, I'm just, yeah. it could go either way, really. What's so it? These are your norms. You want to keep it, revise it? Keep it. Keep it. Keep it. Okay. It's more standard. Okay. Yes. All right, well, we appreciate that. So you're going to stay with us. Okay. Okay. So we're um, in the room. Okay. Well, there's a next step, so we're at the end here. So our next steps are we will come back to the board and we'll schedule a meeting when we bring back the, um, the goals, the priorities, the norms for uh, the norms you know, for reaffirming, uh, reaffirming them. We will spend some time working on the mission statement and customer service philosophy tied into the you know, vision. Uh, and we'll have one vision. Core values. Core values. So we'll work on that. That'll take a little bit more time for that, but we'll come back short order in the next meeting or two. Well, next meeting tomorrow, so not that one. But we'll come back with the other items. So with that, we are done. We can adjourn unless the board has any further Yes, yeah, Chair. Yes, sir. So today was a good uh, productive meeting. I just want to let you know, leadership is not about a title. Our CEO, our board of supervisors, department heads, we're all in this together. And so it's not that the board is, uh, this is what the board is doing, this is what the board wants. Hopefully it's a buy-in from all of you. And hopefully you get other buy-ins from other elected officials as well. We had one left, you know, Donna stayed here, uh, Nate was here, and so, but it's important that we get buy-in from everybody. That E-team is really important uh, to the board. Uh, it's really important because we got, we got uh, our CEO will give us the input at both the E team center. Okay? So just want to let you know that from this board member's perspective, that's our CEO. He's not going anywhere. That's our county council. She's not going anywhere. Other than Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's staying here. Uh, Everyone's staying here. So we're all in this together and let's move uh, you know Southern County in the right direction together. As a one unit. Okay, thank you. Let's pull the rope together. Any other comments? Okay, no, I just want to wrap it up by saying that we, again, that we appreciate the work that you do, appreciate the organization today and putting this together. Uh, I think this is a great exercise for the board to be a part of and along with all the other employees who are here. And we look forward to continuing to work with all of you, except for me. But move forward. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have her, we have Megan's phone number. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.